Good morning, everyone. I'm going, to, I'm going to start just a few minutes early, so I don't want my time to impinge that much on the speakers. They've got so much good information today. So I've got some housekeeping items before I introduce our first speaker. Um, thank you, everyone, for heeding the uh, time change and getting here earlier, uh, despite the weather. Um, you sh most of you were here yesterday, I believe, and so um, you kind of know the drill with some of the things I'm going to say, so I'll try and go through quickly. Bathrooms, there's one at the end um, in the narthex that is handicap accessible. It's just a one-person bathroom, and then there's bathrooms on either side, and also downstairs. The emergency exits, one obviously at the very back, and then both on sides, there's emergency exits on either side of us here in the front. You can go out those doors, you cannot get back in. Okay. Um, the Q&A cards, most of you are aware from last night how we were doing this. You should find them at the ends of your pews. If you can't, look for an usher. They'll have extra ones. Um, we're running out of them, so I uh, robbed my children's stash of notepads, and we're r ripping these out and giving them to you um, so you could use these as well. So uh, just find someone at the end of, we're not doing Q&A till the very end, okay? And that'll be after both speakers have already spoken. And what we've asked is to do one question per speaker. So each person would be allowed one question for Mr. Owen and one question for Father Ripperger. And we'll pick up all of the questions, give them to the speakers, and they're gonna alternate. Mr. Owen will go first with three and then Father Ripperger with three and they'll go back and forth till our time runs out. We do have a hard deadline of 315 because then the church has to prepare for mass. Okay. Um, Another thing is the you're aware of the brain death issue. They, with the talk yesterday, did get into this and how that is um, a topic that not only is um, very much has to do with our topic yesterday and today, but we have doctors on site that have very kindly brought us information. You know, there's booklets at um, the media sales table and the merchandise sales table that you can get for that. And I do have, um, just to let you know uh, why, why do you care? Why do you want to sign this? Because there's forms for you to sign, and they will mail them for you if you don't want to mail them. But um, I have a statement from the doctors, so I'm just going to read it, if you'll permit me. Um, Medical and legal elites want the Uniform Law Commission to make so-called brain death easier to declare, explicitly without consent. Please sign action alert letter in opposition and leave for us to mail. Please take more information. And also in the aisle is Dr. Chris Zaner and Dr. Byrne. The hands up and they're standing. They are our resident expert doctors. Uh, I know Dr. Zaner is a former anesthesiologist and Dr. Byrne, I just know as a doctor. <laughs> Neonatologist, okay. So if you have questions, they are willing to answer them, okay? If you wanna bring more of their uh, forms to your parish, they will help you, okay? And then uh, we would like to ask you, obviously the, the conference is free, but if you are willing to make a free will donation, we would very happily accept that for our speakers. 100% of your donations goes to the speakers and the church. Okay, so um, we would like to be very generous with them. And I'm gonna give you a challenge to be more generous than the people yesterday. And if you were here yesterday, consider giving again. So um, the people yesterday were very generous, by the way. So. Uh, you have a big task ahead of you. All right. Um, so you can give cash, obviously, if you want to make a check out. The check can be made out to the Colbay Center, which is for Mr. Hugh Owen, or um, Father Ripperger's uh, society is SMD. So I don't know the uh, aviation lingo, so Sam, Mary, Delta, SMD. And then also St. John the Evangelist, our beautiful parish, you can make it out to that as well, or cash, whatever. And there will be ushers at the very end that will come and take donations. Please no food or drink in the parish in the upstairs. Downstairs, we do have that for you before the event, uh, during the um, intermission, which will be half an hour, and then a little bit afterwards as well. Um, and there is a survey at the ends of the pews that we would greatly appreciate that you fill out so that we can know how to do this in the future. If we can bring this. Uh, there's a part two to the seminar, so let us know if you're interested in it. It's very important information as well. There's not enough time to do it now. So if you're interested, in, just let us know what you think, and it'll help us to do a better job next time. Uh, it's like five questions, very quick. And please return those surveys to the survey boxes. They're in the back, and the ushers will be holding them, and they'll be walking all around at the very end. 
Okay, so I'll try to go through this quickly. If you need these, these are in the back. These are where I am and where the bathrooms are and all this stuff. Um, you can get those. Okay, so again, my name is Angela Gohl. Uh, on behalf of the three apostolate sponsors in our host parish, I'd like to thank you all for coming today and yesterday. Our sponsors are Catholics United for the Faith, spearheaded by Alan Margo Sheves, the apostolate for, of Our Lady of Good Success, founded by Dan and Kathy Heckenkamp, and Avi Maristella Group, founded by Doug and Angela Gold. And I'd like to thank especially all of, not just the founders, but the board members of these groups who all pitched in on their free time to help out to put this together, and some of them are here running around. So we thank them for that. And we'd also like to give a very special thank, to, thank you to Father Michael Merkt and his staff, who have worked tirelessly and diligently to put this on at their beautiful parish, St. John the Evangelist. So please, um, if you have some time, say thank you to them. Uh, and as you know, Pam, our, one of our speakers, had a health emergency and will not be here, so please offer some prayers for her. Um, and then we did say that anybody who signed up by April 1st would get a free seminar link because she's integral to that seminar. We're not going to be able to give it before the conference, but we're going to work on giving it to everyone after the conference. For anyone who signed up before April 1st, on or before April 1st, and whose email we have, we'll email that out. Okay. So our first presenter is Mr. Hugh Owen. He is a convert to the Catholic faith and the son of Sir David Owen, a former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and former Secretary General of International Planned Parenthood Federation. Hugh attended Princeton University, where at the age of 18, he was baptized, confirmed, and made his first Holy Communion in the Princeton University Chapel on Easter Vigil of 1972. Hugh and, and Hugh's wife, Maria, was a member of the first class of women at Princeton. She and Hugh were married in 1973. They have nine children and 19 beautiful grandchildren, and one of their daughters is a postulant at the Benedictines of Mary. Hugh received a BA with honors in history from New York University and an MS in education in supervision and administration from Bank Street College of Education in New York City. He also received a permanent license to be a principal or superintendent of schools in the state of New York. So for the past 25 years, Hugh has dedicated his life to the service of the church as a writer, editor, teacher, and lecturer. He has been published or interviewed by such notable organizations as um, LifeSite News, Latin Mass Magazine, Human Life International, and so Social Justice Review, just to name a few. For the past 23 years, he has served as the director of the Colby Center for the Study of Creation, which he founded in Mount Jackson, Virginia. And he was recently made a member of the newly founded John Paul II Academy for Human Life and Family, 100% pro-life. This is his third seminar in Wisconsin, actually, including a total of eight talks around the state. So we welcome Mr. Hugh Owen. Thank you, Angela. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. So our topic for this seminar, for my portion, is creation-based natural science versus evolution-based scientism. And uh, we see the agenda that we began to follow last night, and we're going to continue with it today. And uh, so we began by recognizing that a science is an organized body of knowledge, and that theology is the queen of the sciences, the science of God, based on divine revelation. And we saw last night that according to divine revelation, the whole work of creation was supernatural, and therefore creation is actually a proper subject for theology and not for natural science. We saw that natural science is, or ought to be, concerned with the natures and interrelationships of created things, not with their origins. And we saw that when natural scientists work 
Within the framework laid down by Catholic theology, their work flourishes, but when they overstep their bounds and embrace materialism and naturalism and try to explain supernatural realities through natural processes, then their science is perverted and it descends into scientism, a scientism which can be and is being used to establish an anti-Christian totalitarian order throughout the world. Now yesterday we saw that St. Peter, our first pope, was inspired by God to warn us against a future challenge against the fundamental doctrine of creation. And it's in 2 Peter chapter 3, next slide, where inspired by the Holy Ghost, um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, Karen, I think we're on last night because we, remember we changed the slides for today. If not, I can roll with the punches. We can keep going until we get where we need to be. But it's um, the one where we took out some of the slides. Uh, this was the one from yesterday, so we want to go to the other one. Thank you. Just keep praying because our enemy always likes to attack us through technology and we just don't let it get us down. So in a moment you're going to see a slide with the quotation from 2 Peter chapter 3 where St. Peter almost 2,000 years ago warns us against the revolution that is taking place and that has been taking place for several hundred years against the fundamental doctrine of creation. And what St. Peter says in this prophecy is that in the last days, so he sees this will be far in the future, he says scoffers will come into the church mocking the word of God in Genesis and saying things have always been the same from the very beginning of creation, from the beginning of the universe. In other words, he predicts that people will come into the church and say that the same material processes that are going on now have been operating in the same way from the very beginning of the universe. And St. Peter points out in the very next verse that, of course, this is false. And he says that these people will have to de deliberately ignore the fact that it was the word of God that brought the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain into existence. Not a material process like a supernova explosion. But then he goes on to say that these scoffers will also have to ignore the fact that there was a divine judgment on the whole earth at the time of Noah's flood, so that we cannot even know what the earth was like before the flood, much less what it was like when God was calling everything into existence supernaturally during these six days of creation. And this really is extraordinary because the fact of the matter is that these are the two points that the satanic forces have used to try to destroy the foundations of the faith in the true doctrine of creation. And so what I, yesterday we looked at the dogma of creation as it has been handed down to us from the apostles and how it was beautifully summarized in the Roman Catechism, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, the gold standard for teaching and preaching the dogmas of the faith in the entire world for 350 years, still authoritative, the only one that's quoted in the new catechism, quoted 20 times, because it gives such beautiful, clear definitions of the dogmas of the faith. And we saw that according to the Catechism of Trent, 
God created everything supernaturally. He didn't use any natural process, and he created it in six days, and then he consecrated the seventh day. And we saw that the Catechism of Trent taught every Catholic in the world that when God finished creating St. Adam and St. Eve on the sixth day of creation, he was done. And he stopped creating new kinds of creatures because he created everything in this entire universe for us. And, and therefore, the natural order of things that we are living in now did not begin until the whole work of creation was finished. Well, St. Peter's warning is people are going to come into the church and say, no, that's not true. Things have always been the same as they are now in this natural order of things from the first moment of the universe. And therefore, we can study the universe as it is now. And from that, we can extrapolate all the way back to the beginning of the universe and explain how everything came to be. But St. Peter says, these people are going to be completely wrong because they're ignoring the fact, not the pious belief, that it was the word of God that brought everything into existence. And then there was a divine judgment on the whole world at the time of Noah's flood. So people who say everything's been the same are deceived and they're going to deceive anybody who listens to them. But today, not only do most of our Catholic intellectuals deny the fiat creation, the supernatural creation of all things at the beginning of time, they also deny <clears throat> that the flood <clears throat> was a global flood. They say, <clears throat> they tell our young people that the flood was just a local flood. And so it's very important to understand that the global flood was, in fact, global in extent. Because we cannot understand how the world is today without understanding that event. So what we're going to do is to begin with just a very short review of some theological reasons why every Catholic should believe in the global flood as all the fathers and doctors did. Then we're going to look at some very powerful bodies of physical evidence for the global extent of Noah's flood. Now, the, the first argument for the global extent of the flood is that our Lord Jesus Christ compares it to his second coming. When the second coming takes place, it's going to affect every single creature on earth. But the only event in history that our Lord can compare his second coming to in that respect is the flood, because the flood affected every single creature on earth when it occurred. Secondly, all of the church fathers testified to the global extent of the flood. And for them, the global extent of the flood was very important because the ark is a type of Holy Mother Church. And just as there is no salvation outside of the church, so there was no life for those human beings or even animals who were not on the ark. We can also say that the ark, especially in our time, is a type of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And God has made it clear that in these times, if we want to be able to survive with our faith intact, we must consecrate ourselves to our Lord Jesus Christ through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. A third reason why we can know that the flood was global in extent, is that there are different words in Hebrew and in Greek for floods. But these other words are never used for Noah's flood. For example, 
when our Lord gives the parable about man who built his house on sand and then a flood came and it washed his house away. The Greek text does not use the word that is used for Noah's flood because that was a local flood. The word in Greek for Noah's flood is cataclysmos. And that's where we get our English word cataclysm. And it is never used for anything other than the flood because the flood was a global flood and all other floods have been local events. And it's the same in Hebrew. Now, a fourth reason why we know that the flood was a global flood is because it would be absurd for God to ask Noah's family to spend about a hundred years building an ark for his family and for the animals if God knew that it was going to be a local flood. He could have just told them to move over to the dry lands where the local flood wouldn't go. When we tell our young people these kinds of silly things, this is what makes them lose all respect for the word of God and the tradition of the church because they're not stupid. They know that this is ridiculous, that God would tell somebody to spend a hundred years or more building an ark to survive a flood when it was just going to be a local flood. And why take the animals when the animals were perfectly capable of just moving away? And in nature, we see animals know when some tsunami or something is going to come. Long before the humans wake up to it, you'll see them moving out of the way. And finally, a local flood would make God a liar because he promises Noah after the flood that he will never again punish the world in this way. If Noah's flood was a local flood, then God lied because there have been countless terrible floods that have taken tens of thousands of lives and caused all kinds of devastation. So this is a blasphemy, really, to say that Noah's flood was a local flood. Now, if everything were sound in our, our Catholic community, I could sit down now. I wouldn't need to say anything more to you. But the fact of the matter is, we've all been conditioned to want the natural scientists to give their imprimatur before we really fully accept what God has revealed and as it's been handed down to us by the church. And I'm going to show you that when we look at the physical evidence, it actually fully confirms the word of God as it was understood in the church from the beginning. But we shouldn't need this because what we have in the word of God and the tradition of the church should be sufficient. But if you look at this next slide, you'll see the six bodies of evidence that I am going to expound upon briefly. The first isn't really physical evidence, but it's eyewitness testimony from hundreds of people groups all over the world whose ancestors handed down to them a vivid testimony to a global flood. And we're going to see that. And then the second body of evidence is the fact that we find marine fossils of creatures that lived in the ocean on top of all the Earth's highest mountains. Thirdly, the mere fact that we find billions and billions of very well-preserved fossils of all kinds of plants and animals, but 95% of them are marine organisms, is in itself proof of the global extent of the flood. Number four, we'll see that there are sediment layers that cover entire continents and extend to other continents. And there's no local flood that ever has produced set of deposition on this scale in the last 4,500 years. Number five, when we look between these layers, these vast layers of sedimentary rock, 
we do not see any evidence of erosion between the layers, which tells us that they were laid down rapidly, one on top of the other. And finally, we'll see that wherever we go on the earth, we find oversized valleys, water gaps, and planation surfaces which testify to the final stage, the recessive stage of the flood. So let's go through these very quickly. It's very interesting that when missionaries and explorers went all over the world, virtually everywhere they went, the people that they met testified to the flood event and to the global extent of it. And it's fascinating that the closer the people are to the Tower of Babel, the more closely their account resembles the Mosaic account of the flood. As people moved away and time went on, they lost some of the detail that they had received from their ancestors. What's fascinating is these accounts do not only testify to the global extent of the flood, they include all kinds of details that we find in the sacred history of Genesis. That there was one family, that the animals were taken on the ark, that at the final stage of the flood, birds were released to see if the waters had receded, and that the ark came to rest on a mountain. This is very difficult to explain unless all these hundreds of different, different people groups are actually remembering something that truly happened. Here is a photograph of some marine cephalopods fossilized which are found way up on the Himalayan mountains. And we find these kinds of marine fossils on top of all the Earth's highest mountains. Now this is very easy to explain in terms of the global flood because <clears throat> towards the end of the flood, the land masses were on plates and they collided. And when that occurred, there was a massive uplift of all the major mountain ranges all over the Earth. But because the land was covered with these buried marine creatures or somewhere on the surface, when those mountains were uplifted, the marine organisms were lifted up with them. And that's why whether you go to the Andes or the Himalayas or any tall mountain, you will find these creatures that lived in the ocean now uplifted to the tops of the highest mountains on Earth. You will also find formations like the Red Wall Limestone in the Grand Canyon, which is a seven foot thick layer filled with literally billions of nautiloids that were in the ocean. And this graveyard of these marine creatures extends for 10,500 square miles over what is now the southwestern United States. There's nothing in the recorded history of the last 4,500 years that could account for this kind of sedimentary deposition. Now the fact that we even have billions and billions of well-preserved remains of all different kinds of plants and animals is itself proof of the global extent of the flood because fossilization requires very special conditions. Even in an area like this, there are animals dying all the time. There are raccoons dying, squirrels are dying, birds are dying, chipmunks are dying. How many of them will turn into fossils? None of them. Because in order to have a fossil, you have to have the rapid burial of the organism so that it's protected from the scavengers and the microorganisms that would otherwise break it down to nothing. Here you have a fossil of an ichthyosaur mom giving birth to her baby, and she was buried in the sediments of the flood. That's why this was preserved. But it's like a snapshot of what 
happens when fossilization occurs. You have to have very rapid sedimentation that seals off the creature from the scavengers and microorganisms that in the ordinary course of nature just break them down into nothing. Now this is also true of the big creatures like the land, the big land-dwelling dinosaurs. If you go to Montana and you, you go to the areas where there are many dinosaur graveyards, the ranchers will tell you that the normal thing is for these land-dwelling dinosaurs to be buried, jumbled together with the remains of creatures who lived in the ocean, and the ocean is a thousand miles away. And this is the norm. So this is a very striking proof of the global extent of the flood. Now geologists will also testify to the fact that there are sediment layers, like this one shown here, which covers the entire North American continent. And these layers not only extend over entire continents, you can pick them up on other continents, and there are six of them, what they call mega sequences. And here, for example, in the next slide, you can see that this same uh, sedimentary layer that they call the SOC mega sequence covers North America, but you can pick it up in North Africa. Next slide shows how all six of these mega sequences can be found in South America. Now, of course, in the recessive stage of the flood, there was tremendous erosion, so a lot of what had been laid down was eroded away. But you can still see the remnants of all six of these mega sequences over the South American continent. Next slide. Here you see the famous white cliffs of Dover. These are chalk beds, but you can actually follow these deposits all the way from southern England, across Europe, all the way to the Middle East. Now, what kind of local flood <laughs> deposits this kind of material over an area that vast? There's absolutely no comparison between any local flood of the last 4,500 years and Noah's flood, which did this kind of sedimentary deposition. The same thing is true with coal seams. You know very well, you, you look at the road cuts, you see these coal seams, you can follow them all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, but you can pick them up in Europe and follow them all the way to the Caspian Sea. Tell me what kind of local flood could do that kind of deposition over such enormous areas. Next slide. And this slide shows that between these layers of sediment, which then hardened into rock, there is usually no evidence whatsoever of erosion. Now, if these layers had been laid, laid down and then maybe a few million years went by and then the next layer was laid down, we all know that there would have been all kinds of erosion that would have taken place. We don't see any evidence of it. This speaks to the fact that these massive sedimentary layers were laid down one on top of the other in rapid succession. And we also find all over the earth what are called polystrate fossils, which, next slide, which extend through many, many layers of sediment. Now, obviously, this tree did not stand there for 100,000 years or a million years while sediment gradually built up around it. It would have disintegrated in the, in the first 100 years. The only way that this tree was preserved is because the sediments were deposited around it and on top of it very, very rapidly. And that's why we find it. And, and we find such things as enormous whales buried in a vertical position <laughs> with all these layers of sediment built up around them. The whale did not stand on its tail for a million years while this took place. It happened very, very rapidly at the recessive stage of the flood. 
uh, I mean, uh, during the flood, not necessarily in the recessive stage. And the imp very important point to understand from a scientific perspective is, as we saw yesterday, Charles Lyell, who basically laid the foundation for Darwin by arguing that the sedimentary rocks all over the earth were laid down of, over enormous periods of time, and who created, believe it or not, the time, the categories of geological ages in chronological order that is still being used in the 21st century, he had no facilities for doing real experimental research in the field of sedimentology. Now we do. We have proper facilities where scientists can study how sediments are laid down in the real world. And what we now know is that Lyle and James Hutton and all of these uh, uniformitarian geologists left out of account the most important factor in sedimentary deposition, which is moving currents of water. Next slide. And so, uh, next slide. We now have laboratories like uh, this one at Colorado State and at Indiana State Uver University. There's a world-class laboratory like this where scientists can, they have these enormous, uh, they're like uh, gymnasia where they have flumes and they can control all the variables, the flow of the water, the different kinds of sediment, and they watch how it's deposited. And what we now know is that Lyle and Hutton, next slide, and just tap the key a couple of times, they completely misunderstood how sediments are laid down in the real world because we now know from experiments, next slide, uh, I'm sorry, back up one, and just tap uh, the space bar a couple of times and you should get the animation. That's great, you can just leave it there. What's happening here is that you have a moving body of water and sediments are being laid down laterally and vertically at the same time. So if you look at the slide, the lower corner, the sediments being laid down there, and then at the diagonally opposite part of the slide, sediments being laid down, you see that. Well, when this is said and done, and Charles Lyell takes a walk in the country, he's gonna think that the sediment down at the bottom was laid down long before the sediment at the top. They were laid down at exactly the same time. But he does not know that, because he doesn't understand how, sediments were, how the sediments were actually laid down. Next slide. Now, there was an article published in the main geological journal in France by two scientists who examined the Tonto group, which is a very large section of the Grand Canyon, which according to the conventional thinking was laid down over millions and millions of years. Next slide. And what they did was they brought to bear the experimental research in sedimentology that had been done, and they analyzed the sediments that make up the Tonto group, and they show that from the analysis of the sediments, you can see that this whole formation was laid down by an enormous body of water moving across what is now the southwestern United States, and it was laid down in a matter of days. It did not take millions of years. Now, the other thing that very much supports and confirms the reality of the global flood is that when all the mountains were uplifted, if you look at a cross section, you can see that layer upon layer of sedimentary rock was uplifted, sometimes at very sharp angles, and there's no evidence of deformation. They're just beautiful layers all folded in exactly the same way. Well, if they had been laid down one after the other over millions and millions of years, they would have dried out, and when they were uplifted, there would have been shattering, there would have been deformation. You don't see that. What you see tells you, next slide, that when those layers were uplifted, they were malleable, 
because the material had just been laid down by the flood waters. And that absolutely confirms, again, the global extent of the flood and that it happened in a very, very short space of time. Next slide. Another powerful evidence for the flood that you can see all over the world are water gaps. And water gaps are fascinating. They're places where you could be driving on a highway through a river valley and you look at a ridge and you see that there are places where tributaries come into your river valley and the waters feed the river in that valley. But then you see these other places where there are deep notches cut in the ridge and there's nothing going through them. How did they get there? It's very hard to explain this phenomenon in terms of things have always been the same. But if you understand them in light of the flood, it makes perfect sense because when the flood waters receded and went off the continental land masses into the ocean basins, the waters, of course, were carving channels everywhere that they could to get the fastest route to the ocean. But eventually, what happens? The water gets canalized into a few channels. So those water gaps that you'll be able to see when you drive around the country, wherever you go, they are a testament to those first notches that were cut by the waters in the recessive stage of the flood. And now they're there with no water running through them as a relic of that event. And here's another example, next slide. This one, no, I'm sorry, back up one. This is typical of the water gaps that we see, especially when you drive north from where we live in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. You drop into Pennsylvania and you see, and you can see what a deep cut that is in the ridge and there's no water flowing through it but that was definitely carved out by the floodwaters in the recessive stage of the flood. Next slide. Now the other thing that I'm sure you've noticed, which is quite remarkable, is that wherever you go in the world, you see these little pencils of a river flowing through these enormous valleys. Now that is really very difficult to explain in terms of things have always been the same but it's very easy to explain in terms of the global flood. There's one geologist who did a study just of this phenomenon, and he concluded that many, many rivers had up to 20 to 60 times their present discharge. That's a pretty significant difference. And so that's why in the Shenandoah Valley where I live, for example, you have this enormous valley and you have this little bit of water running through it. How did that happen? Well, again, when the waters were running off the continental land masses, they would scour out enormous valleys. But when the floodwaters had all run back into the ocean basins, you just had these little pencils of a river left as a relic of the flood. And finally, all over the earth we can find enormous areas that geologists call planation surfaces. And this is, these are places where water had such erosive force that as it moved, it, it sheared off and planed all the material to a perfectly flat surface. So you might have a very, very hard rock and then an area where there's a very soft rock but when those waters moved over, they sheared everything to a flat surface. No matter how hard the material was, it gets planed to the same level as the softer material. That's a planation surface. And to give you an idea of how widespread this phenomenon is, almost two-thirds of the entire African continent is a planation surface. Tell me what kind of local flood turned almost two-thirds of the African continent into a perfectly flat surface. It's, it's absurd to consider that anything less than 
the global flood event could have left Africa the way that it is. So we've seen, we have eyewitness testimony from virtually every people group on earth to the reality of the global extent of the flood. We have marine fossils on top of all the Earth's highest mountains. We have billions of well-preserved fossils, 95% of them creatures that lived in the ocean all over the Earth. We have sediment layers that cover whole continents and extend to other continents. We have no evidence of erosion between these layers showing that they were laid down rapidly, one on top of the other. And all over the earth, we have oversized valleys, water gaps, and planation surfaces, which are very difficult to explain outside of the framework of a global flood. But another thing that is very important for us to understand in this time of climate alarmism is that only the global flood could produce an ice age. Because during the global flood, and especially at the beginning, there was a tremendous amount of volcanic activity all around the earth. Moses says all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. So a lot of water came up out of underwater chambers, but there was also volcanic activity. And you can see the remnants of that in the ring of fire around the earth to this day. And when this happened, the ocean waters were heated up which produced a tremendous amount of evaporation. So the air was super saturated. But then all the particulate, all the material that was spewed up from these volcanoes partially blocked the light of the sun. So the temperature plummeted. And so what happened to all that moisture in the air? It precipitated as snow and ice and it was something on a totally different scale than anything that had ever been seen before or since, and that's what produced the Ice Age. Now, we were all taught in school that there were multiple Ice Ages, but the evidence really shows that there was one Ice Age that lasted about 500 to 700 years. The book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It was written before Genesis was put down. Even modern scholars generally agree with that. And Job probably lived only about 400, 500 years after the flood. And his is the first book that mentions snow and ice <laughs> because he was still experiencing the conditions in the post-flood world. But of course, there were uh, some fluctuations in temperature during that time. So the, the ice would advance and it would retreat periodically. But those weren't separate ice ages. Those were just variations within the one ice age. And this is very important to understand because when geologists today take the ice cores like what they did in Greenland, they totally misinterpret what they are seeing because they think that everything's been the same from the beginning. And when they see what seem like rapid variations in, in temperature, they think that this represents some cooling period that lasted a thousand years and some warming period that lasted a thousand years. And that is exactly what motivates them to tell us that we're heading to catastrophe because the small changes in temperature are going to somehow snowball and we're going to either have an ice age or then they will tell us that we're going to have uh, the rise of temperature and that's going to be a catastrophe. It's largely based on the fact that they deny the reality of the global flood and they can't properly interpret what they see because when you go down in the ice cores to the places that are recording the changes that occurred during the ice age, there was ongoing volcanic activity and there were variations in temperature totally different than what we see today, but they were taking place within very short intervals, intervals of time. They're not evidence that by slow changes in temperature, you can end up with this snowball effect and have some you know, cat catastrophic 
uh, global warming taking place for a thousand years or something like that. So getting back to the truth with regard to the global flood would be a very important step in refuting the climate alarmists. Now there's another thing that's very important to understand in connection with the global flood, and that is it seems clear that it was a high radiation event because it was a cataclysm and there's abundant evidence that there was actually accelerated radioactive decay during the flood. Now, probably we were all taught in school that one of the reasons that we can be sure that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old and the universe, of course, is so many billions of years older than that is because we have these scientific radiometric dating methods which prove that this is so. So what we are taught is that if I have a rock in my hand and it contains a certain amount of uranium and I know that after 4.5 billion years, half of this isotope will turn into lead, and I, I look at the amount of uranium in the rock and the amount of lead in the rock, then I can know that it would take, say, 1.5 billion years for that uranium to decay into lead and therefore, I know for a fact that this rock is 1.5 billion years old. It sounds very scientific, doesn't it? But what we were never taught in school, unless you were an exceptionally favored student, is that there are three assumptions that go into that calculation, and not one of them is reasonable. Number one, I am assuming that I know how much uranium and lead was in the material 1.5 billion years ago. How could I possibly know that? I can't get in a time machine and go back 1.5 billion years to see what were the original conditions. Assumption number two, I am assuming that the rate of decay of uranium to lead has remained constant for 1.5 billion years. I have absolutely no way of verifying that, and I'm going to prove to you in a few minutes that it's been falsified, that the rates of decay can, greatly, can be greatly accelerated. And then my third assumption is that for the entire history of this rock, it was isolated from its environment. Now, that is totally unreasonable. Uranium is water-soluble. Am I supposed to believe that for this entire 1.5 billion years, water never brought uranium into the system? Water never took uranium out of the system? Not only can I not observe it, it's really unreasonable to think that that could have been the case, especially over such an enormous period of time. Well, it so happens that in recent decades, some very important research has been done that has proven that there was accelerated radioactive decay during the flood. I explained yesterday, and if you go to our website or you get our DVD series, Foundations Restored, you'll get the chapter and verse and the references for this. We saw that carbon-14 which has a very short half-life, which turns very quickly into, back into nitrogen-14, we saw that it's been found in dinosaur bones that are supposed to have become extinct 65 million years ago. But I didn't tell you what is a fact, that virtually everything in the entire rock record that has ever been tested for carbon-14 has carbon-14 in it. Coal and a whole host of other remains of plants and animals contains carbon-14, which proves that this material was deposited thousands of years ago. When a group of scientists took coal 
from deposits dated from about 30 million years ago to 323 million years ago. And they sent it to be dated by carbon-14 in a lab that has an accelerated mass spectrometer that can calculate the number of carbon-14 and carbon-12 atoms in the sample. Every single sample of coal was found to contain roughly the same amount of carbon-14, which proves that the 30 million year old coal was deposited at almost exactly the same time as the allegedly 323 million year old coal. And of course, that's what happened because all of this material was deposited during the flood and that's why when you do the carbon-14 dating, it all has more or less the same age. Now, at the same time, there were, um, there were, there was another phenomenon that was going on, and this is what I'm going to tell you about now. There was a tremendous amount of uranium to lead decay, and when this occurred in the granitic rocks, as the uranium decays into lead, it emits alpha particles. And each of this is a helium nucleus that's composed of two pro protons and two neutrons. And what happens is these get trapped inside of zircon crystals in the granite, which has a very, very tight lattice structure. And then the alpha particle takes on two electrons from inside the zircon crystal and it becomes a complete helium atom. So in other words, when uranium decays to lead inside these zircons, helium is being produced. Now, these scientists looked at a very astonishing fact. Next slide. And this has been observed by scientists since the middle of the last century, that if uranium to lead decay had been taking place in granitic rocks for 1.5 billion years, there would have been a tremendous amount of helium produced as a byproduct of that uranium to lead decay. And over the 1.5 billion years, that helium would have gradually leaked out of the zircon crystals and gone into the Earth's atmosphere. But guess what? <laughs> Way back in 1957, a chemist named Dr. Melvin Cook, who's famous for his work in the field of explosives, was published in the prestigious journal Nature and asked, where is the helium? Where's the helium in the atmosphere that's got to be there if the Earth is billions of years old? Because he pointed out that there is only 0.04% in our atmosphere of the helium that should be there if uranium's been decaying into lead for 1.5 billion years. That is a fact. And this gentleman, next slide, has a PhD in nuclear physics, worked at Los Alamos for his whole professional career, and he decided to team up with some other scientists and do some experiments to get to the bottom of this. So what they did was they took zircons from granitic rock that had had this uranium to lead decay and in which there was still a lot of helium. And then they did very careful experiments to see how long ago these zircons could have been formed with the helium in them based on how much helium is still left in the zircons. And what they concluded from the data is that based on the rate at which helium diffuses out of these zircon crystals, it could not have been more than 14,000 years ago. 
and it could easily have been as low as 4,000 years ago. Because if these rocks were any older than that, more of the helium would have diffused out of the crystals. Now what's also fascinating is that when we were in school, we were given the impression that there are these different radioactive isotopes in the rocks, but if you know how to interpret them correctly, they're all going to tell the same time. Well, that's wrong. In the uh, granitic rocks in Nevada, for example, geologists normally use the potassium to or argon method to date the rocks. Now, potassium to argon has a half-life of 1.25 billion years. So that means I have a rock in my hand, and I have it analyzed, and I find that it has a certain amount of potassium and a certain amount of argon. And based on that half-life of 1.25 billion years, I conclude that this rock is a billion years old. What is remarkable is that in that very same <laughs> granitic rock, from the Sierra Nevada, I can also find radium that is decaying into radon gas. And radium to radon has a half-life of 1,600 years. Now, the rule of thumb is, after 10 half-lives, there's not going to be anything left of the parent substance. So that means, after 16,000 years, there should not be one atom of radium left in that rock. But it's still releasing radon gas. Now that's a problem. This gentleman built a house in an area where the rocks are dated to 80 to 120 million years using potassium argon, but he was shocked to discover they have a radon gas problem in that area. And radon is the leading cause of lung cancer, next slide, among non-smokers. 20,000 people die every year in this country from exposure to radon gas. So this gentleman contacted the local geologist who was in charge, next slide, of the radon extension program. And he asked him, why do you use potassium to argon dating to date these rocks to 80 to 120 million years when you know perfectly well that radium to radon is going on and that the rocks are outgassing poisonous radon gas. And this was the answer from the professor at the University of Nevada in Reno who's paid good money to administer the radon extension program. He said, the former was easier, in other words, to do the potassium to argon dating, and listen to this, the latter would, quote, produce too young an age, unquote. So these people, with all of their advanced degrees, are so committed to the evolutionary paradigm that they would rather put your life at risk than question that paradigm. Now another objection, next slide, that is raised to this idea that there was accelerated radioactive decay during Noah's flood is that, well, that would have incinerated Noah's family and the ark and all of the animals, so that is impossible. Well, I think it's kind of funny that Almighty God worked the greatest public miracle since the resurrection to almost answer, by the way, this objection. And that, of course, was the miracle of the sun at Fatima on October 13, 1917, witnessed by 70,000 people who were not taking LSD. <laughs> and as you know, at the very end of this miracle, there was this beautiful motherly touch from our Heavenly Mother. Because these people had been standing in a pouring rain for hours. Their clothes were soaked. 
Their bodies were soaked. The ground under their feet was soaked. And in a second, practically, everything was dry. Now, if you do a very simple calculation, as I asked my friend, Dr. Thomas Seiler, the physicist, could you please do a little calculation, doctor, of how much heat it would take to dry the clothes, the bodies, and the ground under 70,000 people who have been standing in a pouring rain for several hours? He said, of course, they would have been completely incinerated. So the same God who preserved the 70,000 people at Fatima from being incinerated was the same God who preserved Noah and his family and the animals from the accelerated radioactive decay during Noah's flood. Not a problem. And of course, the miracle of the sun was done to prove that the message of Our Lady of Fatima was urgent and true. And she told us that war is a punishment for sin and that if mankind did not repent and if her requests were not heeded, Russia was going to spread its errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. Well, it so happens that the Bolshevik Revolution took place just weeks after the miracle of the sun. And what many people do not know is the principal error that really took hold in Russia with the Bolshevik Revolution was not communism. It was evolutionism. Because Lenin had been brought up in an Orthodox Christian home, but he became an atheist and a materialist because he read Darwin and the evolutionists, and he thought that science proved that materialistic evolution was true. That's why he could be a confident atheist and a confident communist. On his desk, next slide, and the next one, he had this sculpture, a chimpanzee sitting on a pile of books, one of which is Darwin's Origin of Species contemplating a human skull. And under the foot of that chimpanzee is the blasphemous saying of Satan, you will be gods. And as Lenin sat at his desk contemplating this monstrosity, he authorized the murder of millions of his fellow countrymen because they stood in the way of evolution to the communist utopia. After Lenin came Stalin. Stalin was educated in an Orthodox seminary in Tbilisi in the Republic of Georgia. But he read the works of Darwin and Lyell, became a convinced evolutionist, convinced atheist, then convinced communist, went to the other seminary and said, you have to read these books. The Bible's a pack of lies. We're descended from apes. There is no God. And he was responsible for the murder of 20 million plus human beings because they stood in the way of evolution to the communist utopia. Well, the Blessed Mother said the errors would spread and the Russian communists were the principal sponsors of the Chinese communists. Mao Zedong said emphatically, the foundation of Chinese socialism rests on Darwin and the theory of evolution. Next slide. This is Bishop Cuthbert Ogara, a passionist missionary bishop in China who watched as the communist troops came into his diocese. And in every single town, they would force all the adults into a hall for a seminar. Next slide. So he wondered, what is this seminar going to be? Is it going to be Marx? Is it going to be Lenin? Is it going to be Mao Zedong? It was always the same. Next slide. It was on evolution. You are a product of a material process of evolution. There is no God. There is no soul. There is no afterlife. Because they knew if people would accept this, then they could easily accept the rest of the communist mumbo jumbo. Next slide. Hitler said, the purpose of the Nazi party is to bring evolution 
to the next stage. He had the support of the overwhelming majority of the German intellectual elite because they were all convinced evolutionists. Next slide. In fact, this was true long before Hitler came on the scene. The first genocide of the 20th century was not the Armenian genocide. It was the African genocide. Because in the scramble for colonies, the German military leadership took over large areas of Africa, especially Namibia, and they practically wiped out entire tribes because they considered them like missing links between apes and humans who could just be slaughtered if they didn't do exactly what they were told. Next slide. Mengele was typical of the German intellectuals who thought that it was perfectly legitimate to do experiments on living human subjects in Auschwitz because he reasoned that if I take a less evolved person, like a gypsy or a, a, a Slav, and I strip the person naked and I put them in freezing cold water and I watch how long it takes for them to die, I can use that valuable scientific data to help my more highly evolved Luftwaffe pilot so when he gets shot down over the North Sea, we can help him to survive. That's not wrong. That's just doing evolution in the lab. And of course, Margaret Sanger jumped on the evolution bandwagon because she saw that with birth control, governments could prevent the less evolved people from reproducing and only allow the more highly evolved people, like herself, of course, to reproduce and then we would be able to get rid of, in her charming phrase, the dead weight of human waste. But it gets worse. Here in the US, Kinsey was educated in a devout Protestant home. But when he went to university, he was taught evolution, lost his faith, became an atheist, went to Harvard, got a PhD, and then founded a new science, the science of perversion. And basically, it boils down to this, that back in the Middle Ages, we had this antiquated notion that God created man as man and woman as woman. And from the very design of their bodies, we can tell that there are some kinds of behavior that are natural, normal, and good, and other kinds of behavior that are unnatural, abnormal, and evil. Well, Kinsey says, thanks to evolution, we're liberated because now we can look at our cousins, the bonobos and the chimpanzees, and we see that they do all this behavior that back in the Middle Ages we thought was unnatural and abnormal. Now, thanks to evolution, we know that it's really natural, normal, and good. And so, armed with this pseudoscience from hell, he went to the Rockefeller Foundation, got a big grant of money to begin the scientific study of perversion in which he took people who were afflicted with different perversions, mostly from prison populations, had them do their perversions, wrote up what he saw, made it seem that this was much more common in the general population than it was, and then got the criminal code changed, and the medical code changed, and the psychiatric code changed. So today, there are many places where you could lose your license or go to prison if you do not say that what is unnatural, abnormal, and evil is natural, normal, and good. And this pseudoscience from hell has entered into the very citadel of the Catholic Church. Right here in the Midwest, at the height of the clergy abuse that was going on, that wasn't being reported yet, Father Anthony Kosnick was the rector of a Catholic seminary preparing future priests and bishops, forming them. And in an article that he published at that time in the journal of the Catholic Theological Society of America, he, he stated this. At this time, the behavioral sciences have not identified any sexual expression that can be empirically demonstrated to be of itself in a culture-free way detrimental to a full human existence. This is the complete diabolical inversion 
of the right order of the sciences. Theology is the queen of the sciences. She is the one who should tell the lower sciences what are their boundaries and what is right and what is wrong. Here we see the rector of a Catholic seminar, seminary saying that the empirical scientists can dictate to the theologians and the philosophers what is right and what is wrong. And this is where it led. Cardinal Baldessari was made the moderator of the Synod on Marriage and the Family a few years ago in Rome. And when he was asked by members of the press, Your Eminence, how can you be spending so much time trying to find a way to give Holy Communion to active homosexuals or to people who were married in the church, got divorced, married outside the church, and now they feel excluded and they want to be able to receive Holy Communion? When in the entire history of the church, this would never even have been considered for one moment. This was his answer. There's no reason to be scandalized that there is a cardinal or a theologian saying something that's different from the so-called common doctrine. This doesn't imply a going against. It means reflecting. Because dogma has its own evolution. That is a development, not a change. Even Cardinal Pell, may he rest in peace, who was looked up to as one of the few cardinals who tried to uphold the traditional understanding of holy marriage, even he was deceived by evolutionary pseudoscience. And in a televised debate with Richard Dawkins, the world's leading atheist, back up one please, atheist, evolutionist in the entire world, Cardinal Pell said this, the account of Adam and Eve is a very sophisticated mythology to try to explain the evil and the suffering in the world. It's certainly not a scientific truth. It's a religious story told for religious purposes. Next slide. Well, Richard Dawkins had a field day with that. He said, so the story of Adam and Eve was only symbolic? So in order to impress himself, Jesus had himself tortured and executed in vicarious punishment for a symbolic sin committed by a non-existent individual? I don't want to know how many Catholic young people lost their faith from watching that debate. And it was totally unnecessary because at that very moment, cutting-edge natural science had already proven that the sacred history of Genesis was 100% correct. Between the two sessions, next slide, of the Synod on Marriage and the Family, we teamed up with Human Life International in Rome to put on a symposium to show that the special creation of Adam, body and soul, and the creation of Eve from Adam's side at the beginning of creation is still the foundation of the church's teaching on holy marriage and the family, and that it is totally confirmed by sound theology, sound philosophy, and sound natural science. And to that symposium, at his own expense, came one of the most famous plant geneticists in the entire world, Dr. John Sanford from Cornell University with 30 patents to his credit. And Dr. Sanford proved to this assembly that convened with the explicit blessing of Cardinal Raymond Burke that the proof that we are all descended from St. Adam and St. Eve is in our DNA. Next slide. And next slide. First of all, he showed that scientists have studied the mitochondrial DNA that is passed from mother to daughter in every major people group all over the world. And they were astonished to find that whether they were looking at the mitochondrial DNA of African women, Chinese women, Eskimo women, whatever group, it was almost exactly the same. What also astonished them was there were so few mutations 
in the mitochondrial DNA because most of the scientists were working within the evolutionary framework and they thought that many more mutations would have built up over the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. Instead, they discovered that the average woman is only 21 mutations removed from the mother of all the living. Now, he went on to show, next slide, that if you take the observed empirically derived rate of mutation in the mitochondrial DNA, and you take a standard generation time, and you do the math, you can conclude that mitochondrial Eve, the mother of every woman on Earth today, only lived about 6,000 years ago. Next slide. He then went on to show that exactly the same thing is true of men. Scientists had studied the Y chromosome that is passed from father to son, and once again they were amazed that whether they were looking at Africans, Chinese, Europeans, Eskimos, Aborigines in Australia, the mitochondrial, the, the Y chromosome was so homogeneous. And there were many, many fewer mutations in the Y chromosome than they had expected given their evolutionary time scale. And if you take the observed rate of mutation in the Y chromosome, which is about one mutation per generation, and you take a standard generation time and you do the math, you can calculate that Adam, Saint Adam, also lived about 6,000 years ago. Now, obviously, this is not an exact science, but the point is, these numbers are totally within the biblical chronology framework, but they are totally out of the evolutionary ballpark. They don't have anything to do with any of the predictions of the evolutionists. Do next slide. Dr. Sanford went on to show that if you take the lifespans of the patriarchs recorded in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, and you put them on a graph, they are 100% in accord with cutting edge 21st century genetics. You have St. Adam created in genetic perfection at the beginning, then after the original sin, the bondage to de decay begins, the harmful mutations begin, but he still lives to be 930 years old. Each succeeding generation accumulates more mutations. And so you see the lifespans begin to decline. But at the time of the flood, there's a precipitous decline. And he pointed out this makes perfect sense because all the mutations that had built up in the eight members of Noah's family were now fixed in the human race forever because everyone in this church is a descendant of Noah's family, of course. But we also know that the flood was a high radiation event and there was probably residual radioactivity afterwards which would have increased the rate of mutation to some degree. Now, it's tragic that if our children or grandchildren go to a Catholic school or university and are even given this information, which many of them are not, they are not being told, as they should, that this confirms the sacred history of Genesis as it was always believed in the church. On the contrary, what most of them are being told is, students, please do not think that Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve have anything to do with what we read in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. No, students, what happened was this. There were hundreds of thousands of years of evolution leading up to this point, and then there was a combination of factors, maybe tribal warfare, pestilence, natural disasters, and the population was reduced down to a tiny number of people, and that's why everyone on Earth today is descended from Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve. Now, if I'm a student in a Catholic school and my teacher is telling me this, I'm just going to put it in my notes because I want to get an A on the test. But it's nonsense. Because Dr. Sanford, next slide, pointed out 
that it is a fact that no geneticist denies that we are accumulating mutations in the genome at such a rate that if there had even been 10,000 years of mythical evolution before Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve, they would probably have been so mutant that they wouldn't have been able to have a single viable offspring. And here's another thing that he shared, and you can read the article, God, Family, and Genetics on the Kobe website and get the details. But Dr. Sanford points out that we have discovered that the information in our DNA sequences is so dense that there is no human being or computer on Earth that can compare with the author of that information. Because a DNA sequence in your body right now can be read in this direction, and it will have one message to tell some little molecular machines what to do. The very same sequence can be read in the opposite direction and gives another direction, different one. Then he shows there are also ways that you can read every third letter and get another functional message. And then he says there's also a way that in our cells the same message can be read, translated into a different language, and it gives another direction. So the next time you're talking to an atheist, you can, in a friendly way, say, well, of course, we all know that we have coded information in our bodies. And he'll say, well, yeah, of course, everybody knows that. And you could say, well, and of course, you're up to date on the latest research, so you know that the DNA, DNA sequences in your body right now, they can be read in this way and that way. And according to you, this all happened through a material process. There was no intelligent God who did this. So I just have a, just a simple kind of fun thing that you could do. Just go home tonight and just write one sentence for me, just eight words. I just want it to mean something going this way, and I want it to mean something going the other way. I'll see you in the morning. Because our atheist friend is going to have a very sleepless night. He's not even going to be able to make a sentence of eight words that make sense going forwards and backwards when every cell in his body <laughs> contains information that is practically infinitely more complex than that. But you see what this means is that mutations are always harmful. Because if I have a sentence that only can be read this way, sure, I could make a little mistake. It's only messing up that one meaning. What happens when your mutation changes information that is this densely encoded? you're doing harm every single time. It's unavoidable. And Dr. Sanford points out, everyone in this church accumulates 100 unique new mutations in the germline that will be passed on to offspring. And this is resulting in an inexorable degradation of the human genome. So contrary to what Father Teilhard and his disciples are telling us, we are not evolving into Superman. We are devolving. And therefore, the theory of evolution, so-called, it's gone. It's finished. And of course, this confirms what St. Thomas and all the fathers, doctors, popes, and council fathers taught in their authoritative teaching, that God created everything perfect in the beginning. And since the fall, Everything has been degrading. I'm sorry, next slide. And uh, just keep going until you get to the one that shows uh, Dr. Nathaniel T. Jeanson at the top of the slide. Perfect. 
Dr. Nathaniel T. Jeanson has a PhD in developmental and cell biology from Harvard University, and he has done some additional research from the scientific literature on mitochondrial DNA mutation rates, not only in humans, but also in fruit flies, roundworms, and water fleas. Now, in the evolutionary literature, the origin of modern humans is said to have occurred about 180,000 years ago. Fruit flies are said to have appeared on the scene 20 million years ago, roundworms about 18 million years ago, and water fleas lagged behind only about 7.6 million years ago. Next slide. Well, guess what? From the scientific literature, where we can discover the actual number of DNA, of mitochondrial DNA mutations in all of these different kinds of creatures, we find that the actual number is perfectly in line with the prediction you would make if God created all things less than 10,000 years ago. But it is totally out of the ballpark for all of these organisms if you work within the evolutionary framework. And that brings me to the last scientific topic I'm gonna to cover and then I have to finish. Because of this evolutionary framework and the abandonment of the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation, believe it or not, the consensus view in biology in beginning in the 70s was that since only 2% of our DNA codes for protein, the other 98% was junk that was left over from the millions of years of evolution. This was the consensus view. Next slide. And Richard Dawkins uh, used this as proof that evolution is true. How can you be so stupid as to believe in an intelligent creator when 98% of your DNA is junk. I don't want to know how many Catholic young people lost their faith because of this nonsense. Next slide. Well, when Project ENCODE got funding to study the so-called junk DNA, next slide, they found out, of course, that it's not junk after all. In fact, it operates at a higher level than the DNA that codes for protein. And as we saw last night, it actually, tell, it actually serves, in many, many cases, to turn off or turn on very sophisticated genetic programs, as we saw with our friends, the crested anole lizards in Puerto Rico, who in just a few generations grew very long legs and special appendages so they could climb up walls instead of on trees, as their ancestors had done. All of this was because the junk DNA was activating these programs that already were written into the genome by our creator. Well, John Maddock, who was one of the pioneers in the uh, investigation of the functionality of the so-called junk DNA, said that this failure to recognize the functionality of the non-coding DNA, he said, it will go down as the biggest mistake in the history of molecular biology. Yes, but who was responsible? It wasn't the scientists and medical researchers who believed in the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation. They all knew that the junk DNA was going to prove to be fully functional. And here's the scary part that I have to tell you before we finish, before I finish. Because 100% of the members of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences are evolutionists, they think that we got here through a random process of mutation and natural selection, which God simply got going 13.7 billion years ago with the Big Bang. And as a result, they think that we, with our intellects, are now able to correct the defects of this random evolutionary process. And so they are gung-ho to modify the genetics of food plants so that we can solve the problem of hunger in third world countries. Well, you probably know 
that almost all of our soybeans, almost all of our cotton, almost all of our corn is now GMO. And we have a prominent American member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences assuring us, quote, uh, go ahead, um, three slides to Peter Raven, please. Peter Raven assures us not a single one of the hundreds of millions of people who regularly consume foods produced by genetically engineered plants has become ill as a result of eating such foods. Now talk about God-like God knowledge. This man knows for a fact that there's not one of those hundreds of millions of people who's been adversely affected. Well, thank God there are scientists out there who dissent from this insanity. Dr. Richard Stroman is an expert in this area, and he points out that genes exist in networks. You don't just modify a gene and then you forget about it. That has just affected a whole host of other things, which in most cases we're not smart enough, even our smartest scientists are not smart enough, don't know enough to understand all the ramifications. Next slide. As things stand, agribus agribusiness corporations are not required to do any long-term safety studies with genetically modified food. And the studies that they do don't even have to be published. So, and it's very difficult, well nigh impossible, to get funding to do the long-term safety studies that ought to have been done before any of this was allowed on the market. So when Gilles Serolini, an expert in this area, got funding to do a two-year-long, long-term safety study feeding genetically modified corn to rats, the results were horrifying. Because the longer the rats were fed this stuff, the more their health deteriorated and they developed terrible tumors and problems with their internal organs. And this stuff has never been adequately tested. We're all participating in a enormous experiment that we didn't agree to participate in. And here's the really scary part. These people are not deterred by the work of Gilles Serolini, not one little bit. And they think that not only should they fix the plants to make them better for us, now they want to fix us. Because if we're the result of a random process and they're super intelligent, well then of course, they're gonna modify our genetics and they're gonna turn at least some of us into Superman. And that's what Father Teilhard de Chardin dreamed of before he died. What's happening now? Next slide. The problem is these people haven't a clue as to the actual complexity of the human body. And if they get their way, they are going to create even more of a living hell on earth. Dr. Robert Malone was the inventor of mRNA vaccines. But he's sounding the alarm all over the world that the mRNA vaccine for COVID is a threat to the human race because the people who developed it had no concept of original human nature. Do you think that Adam and Eve were spike protein manufacturing factories? Has that ever been part of what it is to be a normal human being? So why did we let these people get away with this? Because we abandoned the true Catholic doctrine of creation, that's why. And we need to come to our senses now and resist before it's too late. Because if the people at the World Health Organization get their way, they will be able to dictate health policy to every government in the entire world. So 
I don't expect you to take my word for anything that I've said. Next slide. But I only ask you to make your own investigation. And we have a lot of materials that you can use to help you. But if you conclude that what we are defending is the truth, please do not stay on the sidelines, get into the fight. Because our goal is to get this knowledge to every young Catholic in the entire world. Jeffrey Dahmer was known as the Milwaukee monster because he murdered 17 human beings before he was about 30 years old. But what is really heartbreaking is that when he was on death row, his father gave him materials that showed him that evolution was false and that real science supports special creation. And because he read that, he had a sincere conversion to Christianity. And I've done a lot of prison ministry and I'm convinced that his conversion was sincere. But why? Why, next slide, could he not be taught what the little flower in every Catholic child in the history of the church was taught until very recently? And why are we allowing our children and grandchildren to be taught the same science that Jeffrey Dahmer was taught in our own schools. In the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Okay, uh, we, we will have a half an hour break right now. And so exactly half an hour from now. So I know we allowed him to go over because my um, intros went over um, the time a little bit. So exactly half an hour from now. And then uh, please do respect a couple of things. No food and beverages brought up to here. And also please do when you're here, remain quiet because we do have the Blessed Sacrament here. So thank you.
Okay, we're getting a little bit of a late start after the break, so I'm just gonna start with the housekeeping stuff right away so we don't take up too much more because whatever extra time we use gets taken out of the Q&A and I want there to be ample time for the Q&A. So let me just start with a um, reminder about the, the Q&A cards. If you haven't written out your question yet, um, please do one question per person per speaker. So each person gets two questions, one for each speaker. Put them on your cards. We'll have the ushers come and pick them up and give them to the speakers and the speakers will alternate and they will choose the questions that they want to answer and alternate, okay? Um, and if for any reason you can't find a Q&A card, they're not in your pews, there's none left, uh, go to the back, find an usher. They have extras. I have some extras up here, so um, we'll get you one. Also, free will donations. Please, please, please be generous with our speakers in the church. Um, so that we can give them a good send off with generosity from uh, the Midwest, from Wisconsinites. And 100% um, of everything that you give goes to the speakers and the church. So just so you know that. So we really do appreciate your generosity. Obviously, if you want to give cash, that's fine. If you want to write out a check, the places to write them out are the Colbe Center for Mr. Hugh Owen, SMD for Father Ripperger. That's S as in Sam, M as in Mary. D as in Delta, and then St. John the Evangelist Church, if you want to give a specific donation with your checkbook. Of course, you could write checks out to all three if you'd like. Um, please, again, no food and drink from up downstairs into the uh, upstairs. And you remember there's uh, surveys at the end of the pews, and we really, really would appreciate you filling out those surveys. Five simple questions. I bet you could do it in 10 seconds or so. And um, there's a part two to this seminar. They really can only scratch the surface in the amount of time that we have. So if you're interested in this information, we're hoping that you know, there, there could be a part two someday down the road. Um, you can let us know about that. But also, it helps um, other groups that bring in groups like this. So when we first had um, Mr. Owen here uh, five years ago, and actually Father Ripperger was here as well, um, there were other Catholics and Catholic groups that were at, in attendance and decided to invite them back. So if that is your interest, let us know and we'll help you out with that. Um, and please return the surveys to the survey boxes either in the back or to um, any of the ushers that will be walking up and down. So this, the surveys, the Q&A cards, and the donations are kind of all going to happen at the same time. Gives everybody a little bit of a uh, chance to do everything. <coughs> Okay, and then lastly, I'd like to, um, two last things. The, the brain death information affects all of us, and the error that is affecting all of us um, is important for you to know because of legislation that is going on. So there are doctors in attendance here that you can ask questions of. Um, Dr. Chris Zaner here in the aisle, and Dr. Paul Byrne, um, who is, if you'd like to stand up a little bit, they can answer your questions. And there's a, something for you to sign if you would please, um, a flyer that they have, not a flyer, but an informational form. Um, and I think we're out of copies, but they're gonna try and make more copies. If you'd like PDFs to make copies of your own to distribute, please let them know, okay? And they'll mail it in for you too if you wanna give it to them. I'm just gonna read their quick statement. Uh, medical and legal elites want the Uniform Law Commission to make a so-called brain death to make so-called brain death easier to declare explicitly without consent. Please sign action alert letter in opposition and leave for us to mail. Please take information on this. Okay. And then finally, if you are interested in the type of information that was given in this seminar, um, one of the things downstairs that you could buy is called Foundations Restored, and obviously produced by Mr. Hugh Owen and Father Ripperger appears in that as well. So that's something that you could purchase, either physical DVDs or um, streaming, or both. Okay, and now I'd like to introduce our next distinguished guest and speaker. So again, my name is Angela Goal, and on behalf of the three apostolate sponsors, and our host parish, I'd just like to thank you again for coming to this and taking your time out. Our, our sponsors are Catholics United for the Faith, um, and spearheaded by Alan Margot Sheves, Apostolate of Our Lady of Good Success, founded by Dan and Kathy Heckenkamp, and Ave Maristella Group, founded by Doug and Angela Gold. And um, Father Chad Ripperger was born and raised 
in Casper, Wyoming. He has a bachelor's degree in both theology and philosophy from the University of San Francisco. He then earned a master's in philosophy at the Center for Thomistic Studies at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. While in seminary, he completed a master's in theology at Holy Apostles Seminary in Cromwell, Connecticut. He was sent to Rome to complete his doctorate in philosophy at the Pontifical University of Holy Cross. Upon ordination in 1997, with the priestly fraternity of St. Peter, he spent time at a parish in Omaha, Nebraska, and then was assigned to a teaching position in St. Gregory, the great seminary in Seward, Nebraska, where he taught for four years, and then later taught for six years in Our Lady of Guadalupe Seminary in Denton, Nebraska, and subsequently spent three years at a parish in Idaho. He is now the superior of a society that he founded called the Society of the Most Sorrowful Mother. They're also known as the Deloran Fathers. Father Ripperger is a leading expert in spiritual warfare and exorcism with many published works, including uh, Deliverance Prayers for, the, for Use by the Laity, Metaphysics of Evolution, The Principle of the Integral Good, and his latest book, Dominion, The Nature of Diabolical Warfare. You can find these books and many others at his website, censustraditionis.org. You will also see him frequently interviewed on many Catholic podcasts and video channels such as Census Fidelium. He is often quoted throughout Catholic media. He is a highly sought after speaker and lecturer. And while his education and years of diverse experience give his presentations a wealth of informative insights into the Catholic faith and tradition. We are very grateful to have him here this weekend and we welcome him back to Wisconsin. Welcome back, Father Ripperger. First thing I figured we would do is start with actually with a prayer and then um, also say a short prayer, uh, a Hail Mary for the uh, uh, satanic meeting that's actually going on back east. So, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations and carry them on by thy gracious assistance so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee and by thee be happy landed through Christ our Lord, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Virgin most powerful, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. After Hugh's talk, and after we talked again last night, and if you do any kind of research into the effects and fallout in relationship to the evolutionary theory and hypothesis, what you begin to realize is that the import of the theory is grave. It not just affects all the different things in a geopolitical sense, but it's actually affecting virtually every aspect of Catholic life. In fact, if you actually look at a lot of the changes that were made in the church, it was all based on this attitude that modern man has changed and that we're developing and that there's this evolution and that there's, you know, that you can't go back, you can't maintain those things of the past, you have to move forward, and that things are progressing towards a better state. You know, we hear over and over and over again, but it's kind of, I suppose that was the silver lining to the whole pedophilia scandal, is the whole discussion about how it was the new springtime, that all came to an end. Right. The fact is, is that it's not a new springtime. The situation in the church has gotten rather dire and it's decayed. The question really becomes, though, is, is that why are the Orthodox priests and even the traditional priests who are Orthodox, why is it that they don't necessarily support or uphold the traditional doctrine on creation as we read in Genesis? Why is it that they tend to be theistic evolutionists, and why is it that they tend not to actually support those who are trying to defend the church's traditional doctrine, even when they see that it has a direct impact? So, for example, if you, don't, if you believe in evolution, then in the end, uh, there's, as they've shown in discussions, there's no such thing as original sin. Well, if there's no such thing as original sin, just as Dawkins pointed out, then why did Christ ever in the end uh, uh, actually you know, hang upon the cross? It, it, once it is a foundational doctrine, once you remove it, the, the, the traditional doctrine of creation, then from that point on, 
The fact of the matter is, is that the entire Catholic theological edifice collapses, and that's what we've actually seen, right? And so it's, it's one of those key doctrines that if you don't maintain it, nothing else can be maintained. In fact, it's always funny because the first time I read about uh, the doctrine of original sin and actually about uh, the whole creation account was, uh, my parents had kind of talked about it, but it wasn't until I actually had to memorize the Baltimore Catechism, the whole thing, in order to get co confirmed, right? So the first time I hear evolution, I'm like, this is just a fairy tale, right? I mean, it literally, it just made zero sense to me. Um, but I'm going to we circle back around to that, why I think I didn't see the, the theory of evolution as viable, why I didn't see it that way. And I think some of it has to do with my formation, but there's another key reason, which I'm going to address when we come back to the end. So why is it that those who, that, um, those who should be defending the doctrine of creation do not give anything, and it's affected when we see the effect on the faith, on society, education, why is it that so even few traditional Catholic intellectuals among the clergy or laity are willing to actively defend the traditional doctrine of creation? Why? It should be, especially in light of the fact that the modern science and everything, if you actually look at the real science, and this is something that kind of shocked me as I started progressing and just kind of researching even the scientific end, many of the scientists that are at the top, not the ones you see in the media, but many of them that are at the very top of these, of the, um, of the echelon of scientific endeavors in their various fields, many of them don't believe in Darwin evolution at all, especially when you just start talking about the second law of thermodynamics. I mean, you just start, you, just when they see this, yeah, it just doesn't work, right? But they don't say anything, and unfortunately right now, at least from what I can gather, I'm open to correction on this, but it seems what I can gather is that those that are perpetuating it are actually in the middle tier of the, there's a few at the top, but, but those are more agenda-driven, but it's the people in the middle tier of the academia. It's not the real intellectuals. The real intellectuals have a fundamental thing, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, and which is why, in the end, they just don't pay much attention to it, although they do have to to some degree if they want to get funding. This conference is my own take on this. Again, I'm open to the discussion of this and open to criticism as to the why that there's not much of a defense, but not the fact there's so few priests that are willing to stand out there and say things. And I do know some that have preached against it and things like that. But there's so few that are willing to actually put their neck on the chopping block. I think it really has to do with the fact that by the time most of the priests were formed in the last 40 to 50 years or even longer, by the time, we're going to see this in a minute, by the time you get to the 60s and 70s, Modernism had infiltrated so many different facets of Catholic education, even in the seminaries, that by the time you get to that point, the fact that any man comes out of that not being a modernist heretic and rejecting the Catholic doctrine on evolution is almost miraculous. But I think it all really boils down to the fact that the modernism to go back has its roots in the foundation of rationalism. Now, we've brought this up a few times, but I want to go into it a little deeper because this is where the fundamental problem is. Rationalism and the whole rationalist uh, endeavor and which got, of course, part, became part of the Enlightenment, etc. all of that is what's infiltrated the church. Rationalism, is, rationalism, which basically began with Descartes, which we talked a little bit about last night, and it's fundamentally rooted in two things. One is the uh, skepticism about the truth of what our senses tell us, and so it cuts us off from reality as being the foundation for our knowledge of the truth. The second component is founding the certitude of truth in my own thought. So it's not in reality, but it's what I think. Because, uh, and well, in a certain sense, even what I feel, becomes the, it becomes the criteria for certitude. So rationalism, by that very fact that it cut us off from reality as the foundation of truth, meant that how we viewed revelation fundamentally changed. Rationalists do not believe that one can come to true intellectual knowledge of things that come to nature, know the knowledge of nature of things through our senses. 
And as a result, that which pertains to the census was systematically re rejected and ignored. It just, you didn't pay much attention, it didn't have any import or weight. Since revelation is something introduced into sensible reality, God talked to Moses, communicated in sensible reality. Christ came and revealed everything in sensible reality. Everything is revealed in sensible reality. There are only a few things that were communicated to the apostles in the process of inspiration in relationship to scriptures or that were taught to them afterwards by illumination. But the fact of the matter is, is that a vast majority of every, all the essential doctrines, basically, um, that was necessary for salvation, but also many of the teachings of the church were introduced through sensible reality. This meant, therefore, that revelation, which comes in sensible reality, even the oral tradition of the church is through sensible reality, that gets cut off. And there is, technically speaking, no true revelation from God. They try and get him in the back door, though. If one is cut off from reality, then one is locked up inside oneself, and so what pertains to one's experience becomes paramount. After Descartes came a guy by the name of Spinoza, and he systematically attacked the authenticity of the oral tradition regarding the scriptures and through his philosophy. So he was the guy that started just systematically denying any type of miraculous in scriptures, cutting them down, cutting, trying to attack the veracity of their lineage as being passed from the apostles on all of that. And as a result, it began to change people's worldview. As empiricism rose, which basically takes only what we can, ironically, what we can know through our senses as anything, or, or actually our experience of concrete things, as the view of man became, no, man became just viewed as purely a material being. And this led to fixing man's meaning in the now, in the present. Since for the empiricist, man's meaning is found in what he senses and feels, this led eventually to lack of interest in the past. <clears throat> Since the past as such, and the future for that matter, cannot be sensed nor fulfill our, sen our sensible desires. With the advent of Hegel, now Hegel was the guy who started this process of saying that everything is, in, is changing and it's constantly changing, it can't help but change. He said, if you actually look at the world, he said, there was this thesis that is the current state of the world and its circumstances. Then what happens is arose an antithesis, which was the opposite of that, right? And then from that rose the, the, um, the synthesis, which included both, which violates the principle of contradiction, by the way, which is so elementary a way to dis just to say, well, obviously his theory is wrong. But it meant that for Hegel, and technically speaking, and this was true even for Spinoza, there was only one thing that existed, God. Spinoza, the actual reference to God is Deus sive natura. Now, you have to understand exactly what that means in Latin. Deus is, of course, God. Natura is nature. But sive means or, but it's a conjunctive or. It means God or what we would call nature, so that they're one and the same in his view. Hegel had the same view. The only difference is, is for Spinoza, it was static. It just never changed. Whereas for Hegel, God who entered into contact with the created order, or which was only one thing, God, was in this constant state of flux, constantly changing. This is why even in Catholic circles who have adopted Hegelianism actually believe that God actually changes. This is why you'll hear things like, well, the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. They're not different at all. We even see this creeping into even some of the most elementary doctrines of the church, You'll hear people say God forgives and forgets. He can't forget. He can't change. He's eternal. It just means that his, uh, through his mercy, he no longer applies the justice to your sin. For all eternity, he's got to look at this. This gives you the, this is why we actually read in the Psalms, his mercy endures forever. So that when you get to heaven and he's forgiven it, it's for all eternity he's forgiving it, even though he sees it. So once Hegel shows up on the scene, the intellectual groundwork is laid for the wholesale lack of interest and interest of tradition. 
Because things are constantly changing, this thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and then the synthesis becomes the new thesis, then you have an antithesis, and this just keeps going on and on and on. The original state, what was originally revealed and what we have now in their minds is completely different. And you have to basically look at them, or if it's not completely different, it's changed so much. And by the way, now they actually believe, and this was a hallmark of the theologians during the 50s, was that because of Hegelianism, it meant that every successive generation could not help but modify and change revelation in the passing and the teachings of the church as it passed on from one generation to another. This is why the prior generation, in my own opinion, is one of the most perverse, we call them the greatest, but it's one of the most perverse and degenerate generations that has ever existed in the history of the world. How do we know this? They took a church that was financially, spiritually, and morally at its prime and handed my generation of priests a church that is spiritually and morally and financially bankrupt. They could not leave a single thing alone. This is why Hegelianism and even this whole idea, which of course is just evolution, becomes part of this whole evolution of dogma, dogma right? And so they just can't, they literally, they couldn't leave a single thing. There's not a single thing in the church that they couldn't leave alone. And it's because there's this attitude of, well, each generation changes it. This is simply not true. One of the guarantees of Christ and through the Holy Spirit is that the doctrines of the church will remain incorrupt from the beginning until the end. It doesn't mean that certain magisterial members will say things contrary to the faith, but it means that they will remain incorrupt the church's teaching will never change because God never changes. Human nature doesn't change. Original sin doesn't change. Our need for forgiveness doesn't change. Our need for all these things doesn't change. And so what happens is, is that tradition it was looked at as something that's outmoded, outdated, and we needed to move beyond it, so there became a distrust of the tradition. As a consequence, those who wanted to impose some religious teaching based on tradition or history became suspect. They became ignored. At the same time in which the intellectual underpinnings for trusting tradition collapsed in the minds of modern intellectuals because of this whole theory of evolution creeping into even the areas of dogma, under the impetus of modern philosophy, a growing immanentism arose from three sources. Now, immanentism comes from the two Latin words in and monere, which means to remain in. And it's the principle that basically holds, it's the foundational principle of modernism. While evolution is the, pri the principal doctrine, or a primary doctrine, it's the immunitism is the principle, it's the primary principle that undergirds all that. And it's the principle that basically says that the source of truth is not in reality. My mind isn't true because it conforms to reality. My mind is true because my thoughts don't contradict each other, as I mentioned last night. So this source of immunitism arose from three sources. The first was Kant who through his epistemology was founded on Cartesian and empirical skepticism of the senses. But he left us locked in one's own mind, logically speaking. If you want to read a phenomenal book, although you have to be pretty knowledgeable in philosophy and theology, it's called um, God in Exile by Cornelio Fabro. In there he shows once you accept, once you accept the Cartesian cogito, once you accept it, and then he traces it through every single modern philosopher just about up to the present day, the trajectory is always atheism. Have you ever wondered why modernist clerics virtually never talk about God? That's why. They left one, so they leave us locked in our own mind. It's no longer reality. This meant that everything is within ourselves and one's own mind, which means that man's experience becomes essential because in the end, everything remains in himself, man's experience. This is why you'll hear even priests say, well, we have to, have to make sure that the people have a good experience. Really? I don't think Christ was sitting there saying, you know, hang on this cross, I'm having quite the experience. <laughs> and it flies in the face of the entire spiritual tradition of the church, which basically means that the first thing that God does when he loves you is he makes your life miserable. Okay, how's that for experience? All right. The second source of immunitism was the location of the theological experience within the emotions. So first you have Kant. You got this intellectual 
practice no longer following objective revelation and the magisterium's of, uh, adjudications and judgments about what is contained in revelation. That was an objective standard to which is the rule of faith to which we must all conform. That ceased being the case. And then it then shifted to this imminentist thing. But in the end, given fallen human nature, the trajectory is that you're just going to follow your emotions. And that's where a guy by the name of Frederick Schleiermacher comes in. Now, Schleiermacher said that religion was primarily an expression of piety. Now, here he's not talking <coughs> about the piety. He's not talking about piety in the traditional sense, which is where you give honor to those who are above you or your parents primarily. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the emotional experience that we have when we do pious things, that is, go to church and things of this sort. And so, in the end, piety is found only in the emotions. Religion could not be satisfied with metaphysical treatises and analysis, he said. It, it is a rational ap approach to religion. That is, rather, it must be something emotional. This led to the imminentism of religion, since piety and religion ex ex experience was something within the individual. This basically degenerated into everything, even our liturgy to this day is now just imbued with making sure that people have a good experience. This is one of the fundamental reasons why they're losing the young. The reason they're using, losing the young is because emotion over the course of time, if, there, if, you, if, if the goal of the liturgy is to give me a nice emotional experience. The young are going to go play video games because they're going to get much more emotional excitement out of that. And so what happens is, is that we expect in the liturgy to conform the liturgy to people's emotional states rather than the people conforming themselves to God, to an objective cult. And by that I mean the objective worship which conforms itself to God. Third, source which led to imminentism and therefore an intellectual formation for the acceptance only of the present and a rejection of the past was by Maurice Blondel. Blondel held that modern thought considers the notion of imminence as the very condition of philosophizing. In other words, truth is in my own mind and if I'm gonna philosophize, it has to be purely something that's in my own mind. That is to say, if among current ideas there is, this is uh, Blondel, if among current ideas there is one which regards as marking a definitive advance, see it's that evolution thing, it is the idea which at the very bottom perfectly true that nothing can enter into man's mind which does not come out of him and correspond in some way to a need for expansion and that there is nothing in the nature of historical traditional teaching or obligation imposed from without that counts for him. The tradition means nothing. Why would it? If everything is changing, if everything is evolving, you wouldn't even pay any attention to it. For Blondel, only those things which come from man himself and which are imminent to him have any meaning. No tradition or history has any bearing upon his intellectual considerations unless it is somehow comes from himself. These three sources of imminentism as they influenced the church during the waning of the intellectual phase of modernism in the 1950s and early 1960s provided the foundation for a psychological break in, as tradition as the norm. Okay, again, this is all part of the evolution. If you actually look at the uh, her modernist heresy, it actually had four phases. We're actually in the fifth. The first four is the initial phase began around 1832 when it was called liberalism until the beginning of the First Vatican Council, 1869. There are very distinctive things that they were dealing with in the First Vatican Council, which unfortunately got cut short because of the Franco-Prussian War, which hopefully, or should it had been properly, the remaining scheme had been properly dealt with, a lot of this stuff we wouldn't be dealing with. But it terminates then. The second phase was called the intelligentsia phase. This begins from after the, second Vat or the first Vatican Council and goes up to the condemnation of Pius X when he formally condemns modernism. So that begins the intelligentsia phase. It's during that phase that you see, especially the scriptural studies, all this stuff starts really creeping in heavily, much more heavily into the Catholic intelligentsia. 
Then from 1907 until 1955 or 60, roughly, is the underground phase. The intelligentsia were still completely influenced by it, but they started influencing the upcoming seminarians and stuff. Look at the collapse in the church didn't come out of a vacuum. The call for massive changes in the discipline of the church and its liturgy and all these things didn't come out of a vacuum. It came because all this stuff was actually being developed underneath. It's also during that time frame that you see people like Chardin and all these guys start to get to come to the surface and get a certain kind of a name. And it was underground because of the fact that if you got caught being a modernist, you could get booted out of the seminary. And then we entered in after, so after, from about 1955, 60, the intellectual gas of modernism starts to run out. And so then you end up in a superficial phase where they're just saying stuff that's just daft. Over the course of time, that lack of intellectual depth, and that is that the intellectual shallowness eventually doesn't satisfy people. So over the course of 50 years, they began to lose the intellectual argument in relationship to orthodoxy, because as the orthodox priests and clergy and theologians began defending the orthodox position on a variety of different things, what happened was is that they, they couldn't defend their position because they just got mopped up intellectually, and so the only thing left now is force. And so now we're in that phase, where they're just trying to cram this stuff down and they're trying to make changes permanent. How do you make changes permanent? The next guy can come in and change them. But this is this, this is this mindset of we, we have to keep moving forward and we can't go back because in the Hegelian dialectic, you can never go back to the original thesis in that process. You always go through the antithesis and the synthesis and the synthesis can never go back to the original end, uh, thesis. Blondell was working at a time when the church was just become, coming to the conscious conscious awareness of the fact that it was heading for a definitive break with the tradition the work of Vlandell and the influx of all the modern philosophical views which were antithetical to ecclesiastical tradition had a drastic impact on the church. Vlandell and others, under the influence of modern philosophy, thought that modern man could not be satisfied by past ways of thinking. We have to move beyond this. We have to evolve past it. They provided an intellectual foundation upon which the church, with the council as a catalyst, would update itself or undergo an adjournamento. With the foundations for the extrinsic tradition, that is the very tradition of the church, having been supplanted, the tradition was lost. In other words, the new view of man had changed. And since the view of the deposit was subjected to modern analysis, the deposit of faith is what's passed on through the tradition, the tradition which rested upon these two collapsed. We are currently living in the full-blown effects of that collapse. The members of the church today have become fixated on the here and now, and the past traditions are not only irrelevant, but are to be distrusted and even demonized. We see this even with the whole thing. The number of Catholics that actually subscribe to gay marriage is profound, even though this is completely contrary to the entire tradition of the church, completely contrary to the entire Judeo-Christian history. Hence, when you, so if you look at this, all of this is collapsed. And so even traditional priests, even Orthodox priests, are growing up in the ambient of modernism and the principle of eminence, where we ourselves become the objective principle um, by which we judge things, these things rather than the objective criteria and what the tradition has always said. That means that when it comes to the traditional understanding of the Genesis account or of creation, that too is subject to this very same thing. It's not believed because it's part of the tradition. In other words, what most people don't seem to grasp is that modernism is such a toxic heresy. It is so toxic. And by that I mean it's so much in the air. The odds of people not having modernist thinking somewhere in their thought is astronomical. And I'll be honest with you, I've only met probably about 10 people in my entire life that I could say this person doesn't suffer from modernism. Only 10 
It's everywhere. And this meant that even the priests that were growing up and, and be, going through their formative years, they all got exposed to this. And so even when they come into the tradition, that's still part of their intellectual formation. See, what most people don't realize, although the communists seem to have realized this very early on, is that if you get children when they're very young and you start forming them, they start creating intellectual habits which determine how they judge things. And that determination on how they judge stuff, even if they, they recognize what you're telling them is false, that habit is still there and it takes a long time to undo that habit. And a lot of times it doesn't get undone and that's what we're living in. The reason many Orthodox priests and bishops don't come to the defense of the traditional doctrine on creation is precisely because their intellectual habits still cause the emotional reactions when they hear it. It's this... It's this fear or revulsion that they get because that's how they were trained. That, oh, that's just ridiculous. Only children think that when actually the real fable is the, is the evolution. Modernism and the principle of evidence, as I mentioned, is such a topic, toxic heresy. And I think, again, it's the reason why so many traditional priests don't do it because in the end, many of them are so, have even bits and pieces, even in their thinking, it's still modernist. And I don't mean to discourage our love and devotion for them, but the fact is, is that this is one of the things that's happening. Part of it is that they are ignorant of the tradition itself. They, don't, they haven't studied the tradition. This is the beauty of all the work that Hugh has done and has actually produced, is the fact that the tradition is coming alive again so people can actually read this and actually get a sense of it. People act like evolution is this new theory. Well, St. Paul says there's nothing new under the sun. These it, uh, granted, it's the product of a, of a tremendous philosophical pedigree in, in modern age, but this idea that things are changing, conscience changing, it, et cetera, this has been around forever. It's, they act like the fathers of the church didn't have any knowledge about of this in light of, of the creation account. They fully knew all the different theories of Democritus and all these guys that, that had come up with alternative theories. They knew all that stuff, yet they knew this, what God has revealed is what is to be held. Then, if you look at the history of modernism and this influx of bad philosophy, the church went through a series of collapses. Most of them were unperceptible. But if you go back and look at the literature over the last 150 to 170 years, you can see distinctive shifts that start to occur within the context of Catholic thinking. And the first shift, the first collapse that happened is by the late 1800s, the, uh, a full-blown collapse had occurred in relationship to Scripture. I mentioned Spinoza, who systematically attacked the authenticity of the oral tradition regarding the scriptures. In fact, Spinoza, who lived, even though, even though he lived much earlier than that, he held, as I mentioned, that there was only one thing. But the point is, is that he was the one who basically, he even got excommunicated by the Jews, he was so bad. But he was the one that began this process of dissembling the of scriptures this left most of scripture in the eyes of academics as not a reliable source. He had dis dissembled it, and part of this had to do with the fact that by the time you get, so it, a very fascinating thing, it's, it's just a little bit before the first Vatican Council and after the second Vatican Council, there's this collapse among the recognition that scripture is divinely inspired. And a lot of that had to do with, there was also an attack on the very nature of inspiration itself. Pius XII recognized the necessity to actually give a definition of it. And in the definition, if you look at it, he says that in the end, God is responsible for every single word in the original text of divine, that were divinely inspired. He communicates that knowledge to the author, but the author, it's God who is responsible for ultimately what is produced, because he can determine what the author writes or not. But what happened is, is they started shifting and basically not believing in divine inspiration, and so this ends up, this ends up collapsing. So the first thing that collapses is scripture. This is why evolution starts making quite a bit of headway in relationship to Catholic scholars. This is why by the time you get to the 1950s, it's already imbued in the thinking of these people. Once 
the scripture collapsed, the next collapse happened in the early 1900s. This is when ecclesiology collapsed. So if you actually look, okay, so let's back up. It's interesting that if you want to read some of the most profound, detailed working out of what divine inspiration is and precisely how it works, it was actually being done by the theologians after the First Vatican Council up until about 1910. Because that was the debate. They knew that that was a key hinge, and they had worked it out based upon the writings of uh, Augustine and then, of course, the subsequent tradition. Augustine plays a key role in all that. But this is one of those things where they had worked it out, but it got systematically ignored. Why? Because the intelligentsia, who is now in charge of basically the, the various academic institutions that were infiltrated in the institutions, made sure that that understanding, the scholastic understanding of precisely how inspiration worked and therefore how we were going to read Genesis, that they made sure that never saw the light of day. So then the ecclesiology collapses. This is when you start hearing people say that the Catholic Church is not the only divinely established means of salvation. And you start to see it creep in primarily from the branch theory started by the, uh, the Protestants because they didn't like the idea that the Catholic Church was claiming it was the only true church. And so they had to come up with something to kind of get their foot in the door. And so you see at First Vatican Council, they actually say it's a formally defined teaching of the church that the principle of unity, you cannot be in the church which Christ established unless you are in union with the papacy. It says it, that's a formally defined fact. The, princi the papacy is the principle of unity in the church. But then there was a shift because of this whole um, branch theory, and it started working into the modernists. Again, this is where the development of dogma, you even hear people say this. This is a formally defined thing. You cannot be Catholic and reject that teaching of the First Vatican Council, but by the time you get to the Second Vatican Council, the ecclesiology had shifted to where now the principle of unity was no longer the papacy, but the episcopate. A very subtle shift occurs, but it's gargantuan. And this is why they say things are developing. This is why they say you can be saved and not be a member of the church, right? But then also, then, so scripture collapses, you have an ecclesiological collapse, an understanding of what the actual church is, which makes sense, because once uh, scripture's gone, well then what St. Paul says about the, the mystical body of Christ is all shot. And then the next thing that happens is it starts to creep in in the 30s, but the, by the time you get to the 1950s, there's a, there's a collapse of the natural law understanding of the foundation of morality in the Catholic Church. So you can actually see that there's shifts in the, um, the manuals during that time where it's very clear in the 30s and 40s that there are certain things, certain acts that are considered against the sixth commandment, it's even within the context of marriage, and the church is very clear about them, but by the time you get to the 50s, that natural law underpinning for that collapsed, and so now you have some theologians in the 1950s allowing acts which the church had said were not contra naturum. They're disordered intrinsically. So that by the time you get to the Second Vatican Council, so all this progression is happening. There's this devolving that's occurring within the church. By the time you get to the Second Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council wasn't the cause. It was the catalyst. It was the moment that they seized in order to blow all this stuff out, right? And so this is why after the Second Vatican Council, in fact, if you can even read it in the documentation, even while the Second Vatican Council is going on, the theologians, who are basically modernist heretics, were running back to their diocese, telling the lay faithful, because at the third session of the Second Vatican Council, they were arguing over whether contraception was going to be allowed. Paul VI pulled it from the floor because it got so heated, and that's why he put out, he himself, put out Humanae Vitae, but, it's by, the, but by this time, the toothpaste was out of the tube. These guys were running back to their diocese saying you can contracept because the church is going to change its position. Why? Because dogma evolves. So once the scripture collapses, all of the, the, the foundation of the church is teaching on that collapses. The relationship between the evolutionary hypothesis and historicity of the first three chapters of Genesis has a long and involved history. But the Pontifical Biblical Commission had already made the ruling. Now, this was back when the Pontifical Biblical Commission was actually part of the magisterium. And so this is when they basically said that these things are to be interpreted 
as actual history, there was a widespread rejection of the literal sense of the first three books of Genesis by the denial of the proposition that the first three books of Genesis contained actual historical events. They, it was re being rejected, and the Bond Episcopal Biblical Commission came out and said no. The rejection of the histori historicity of the first three books of Genesis is motivated by a basic worldliness, though. And by that is meant a desire to conform scriptures and theology to the hypothesis present within the world and by the scientific community of the day. It was an inversion of the process that should have occurred. In fact, the entire history of the church, the scholastics actually talk about this, that you can actually know that your natural science is actually less likely to be erroneous as long as it doesn't contradict what the church knows to be actually true doctrinally. Why? It's very simple. God cannot fail as a cause because he's omnipotent. In fact, God's ability to bring a thing into existence, he just has to think it exists and boom, it's in existence. He doesn't have to work at it. He doesn't have to do anything. And so what this means is, is that in relationship to the faith that he infuses in your mind at the time of your baptism, it's in your intellect, and then the cause of him on the side of revelation, on the side of the cause, those two things are absolutely certain. This means that what we read in revelation and what we read in scripture is absolutely certain because he is its cause. The difficulty comes on the side of the individual, which I'm going to return back to this. So that means that if you come up with a hypothesis in your natural science that contradicts what we know on the side of what God revealed, you're wrong. It's that simple. This is what the scholastics talk about how even though we don't use revelation as the primary means in the empirical sciences, it's a great check to keep us in order so that we don't end up stepping outside our bounds. This is why we read in the documents of Vatican I, we also reject and condemn by an anathema the doctrine which asserts the treatment of the natural and rational sciences so that they were necessary to be of their own right and plainly independent. That propositions which in them are established and deduced, although contrary to the Catholic doctrine, are not under the judgment and authentic prescription of the church, and therefore the natural and rational sciences also with their differences are to be treated as errors contrary to the Catholic faith and doctrine which bear no resemblance to supernatural revelation. Essentially what the church has defined is that it is entirely within its right to pass judgment on the propositions of the natural sciences if these propositions are contrary to Catholic doctrine. This means that it is within the right of the church to pass judgment on those aspects of the evolutionary hypothesis which are contrary to Catholic doctrine. Vatican I goes on to say, if anyone says that it is possible that at some point, at some point in time, given the advance of science, a sense may be assigned to the dogmas propounded by the church which is different from that which the church has understood and understands, let him be anathema. Essentially what the church is saying is that between the two citations is that if a natural rational science concludes something that is contrary to the faith, the natural rational science is to be considered in error. Because why? Because the source of our knowledge of these things from God who revealed them and on the side of our faith it's more certain. It doesn't mean that we, because of our subjective defects and things like that, don't struggle a little bit with our faith, but on the side of the cause, they're certain, especially in relationship to revelation. And therefore, if something contradicts revelation, it is to be considered in error, because God can neither deceive nor be deceived. The church is not to be expected to conform its teachings regarding doctrine to the hypothesis of the natural or rational sciences. Especially, the, especially if you look at it. If the church is going to conform itself to the teachings of the empirical sciences, it would be all over the map. Because, you know, it's, it's like you say, well, we, we, they, they, and this is my complaint. 
I would have less of a difficulty if they just proposed something as a hypothesis or as a theory. But what happens is, is they post something, as I mentioned last night, where it's absolute dogma. And then five months later, 10 years later, well, that's out. Now this is the new dogma. It's literally a religion with these people. You know, this, that, you know, the age of the universe was like this dogma set in stone. Well, now it's changed because they're like, okay, we got data that doesn't line out with this. But that should tell them that when it comes to these things, the principle of evidence which states that the degree of certitude has to be based on the evidence should tell them that, look, our evidence is such that it's, we're not going to have the degree of certitude that we would have from our faith, from what God has revealed. Part of the reason has to do with the greater, where the greater certainty lies. See, Descartes thought that the greater certainty lied in mathematics or in the rational sciences, but in point and fact, on the side of the cause, it resides in theology. Regarding matters of faith, many of them are actually more certain than those things which pertain to the natural sciences. St. Thomas says, quote, nothing prohibits that which is more certain according to nature to be, uh, to be with respect to us less certain because of the weakness of our intellect, which relates to those things most manifest in nature as the eye of the owl to the light of the sun. Hence the doubt which happens in some people about the articles of faith is not because of the incertitude of the thing. Why? Because God caused revelation. God caused creation to be done in the manner in which he revealed in scripture because he is the author of the scripture and is responsible according to Pius XII for every word. And so that is more certain on the side of the cause. It's not because of the incertitude of the thing, but because of the weakness of the human intellect. This is precisely why we need a source like the church to tell us, don't do this, this isn't true, this isn't correct. On the side of those who want to be able to conform Catholic doctrine and the scriptures to evolutionary hypothesis to what has now known become as continuous creation, so now we've got that, they admit that the concept, so this is the theistic evolutionists, they admit that the concept of con continuous creation does not appear to be in the text of the magisterium of the church. You can't find it anywhere. There's nowhere where it says in the magisterium of the church that there's this continuous creation. It is not present among the medievals. It's not in the fathers of the church. But one is able to find it express precursors, they argue. Oh, well, there's some of this stuff was there. Usually they point to St. Augustine, but Hugh's got a great analysis of that. Effectively speaking, they admit that the idea of continuous creation, which is necessary for theistic evolution, in which God must continue to create new creatures, even from the initial creation, the beginning, is not found anywhere in the magisterium of the church, among the medieval theological schools, or in the fathers of the church. Now, if you've read anything of mine, you know that when the fathers of the church are unanimous, or the theological schools, that is the theologians of the theological schools from 1100 to 1750 are unanimous that something's of the faith, or that it's formally defined by the, by the church in its magisterium, then it's infallible. There's not a single doctor of the church that would subscribe to evolution, or especially among the fathers. This would be the end of the this should be the end of the discussion right there. However, the motivation behind wanting to conform the interpretation of the first three books of Genesis to the evolutionary theory is driven by a desire to conform Catholic doctrine and scriptures, etc., as much as possible to the natural and rational sciences out of pure, unadulterated human respect. That's what's at the root of it. Theistic evolution has already been addressed by basis last night as I talked about how it violates the principle of economy. However, it should be noticed that in a notion of continuous creation, which dealt with more below, essentially asserts that there's constant miracles happening because nature can't beget this higher thing. So God has to suspend the laws of nature and bring up this higher thing each at each and every step. However, the very nature of a miracle is that it's the exception, not the rule, because it is suspension of the laws of nature and God normally rules through the laws of nature. Creation by its definition of bringing something out of nothing on the part of God is a miracle and therefore is not the rule. It's the 
thing that he does exceptionally, it's the preservation and being, the conservation of these things and the providence of these things through the natural order is the rule. It is for this reason that St. Thomas says that God acts in every way by conserving and administering the established creature, not, however, in creating a new one. When one considers the rational sciences, namely philosophy, specifically after the time of Descartes, but include Hegel and Hume and the like, there's a few things that one is kind of struck with. The first is the fact that many who were proponents of evolutionary hypothesis were deists, for example, James Hutton, John Baptiste de Lamarck, Charles Darwin, and Charles Lyell, among others. These were all deists. And deism is a philosophical system which, God, which states that God created the world initially and then he backs away and has nothing left to do with it. And so it just kind of goes on its own. One can see how the evolutionary hypothesis rose out of this philosophical framework, which is essentially a theological error, but it's also a philosophical error. They wanted to exclude God. So as far as those who should be teaching creation and not evolution, there is a human, a human respect element that's involved. This is what we're dealing with, it's human respect. It's the same reason why one of the fundamental mistakes in my own estimation, even though I have six academic degrees in philosophy and theology, is the church never should have started awarding degrees. They only, and by here I mean, you know, in the seminary, and the, because the reason was, is that, and this was a, something that was actually going on in the 1950s, is, is that all the academics wanted to have a credibility in the eyes of their secular counterparts by having degrees. But it was that same human respect driving that, but also driving to wanting to conform the church's teaching to the modern theories. But it's also because of they're subscribed to modern philosophical ideas where there's an exaggerated certitude in the empirical sciences. If anything has shown us in the last four years regarding COVID and all of that is that the science ain't settled, right? It's changing. It doesn't mean it doesn't have value. It doesn't mean that we're not learning. It just means that it's not as settled as they like to make it out to be that the members of the church cannot pass judgment on the empirical and natural sciences is also something that imbued their minds. Many traditional priests, and even traditionalists, even members of the magisterium, are men of the modern era, and so scientism rules the day, even though they don't realize it. They've, they've, they've breathed in the toxic air, as I mentioned. Scientism seems to be true because of technology, because they're producing wonderful things, right? But these are distinct from the theology, or the, sorry, the theory behind how these things work. The theory behind technology and how to advance is different from the actual ability to produce it. Also, technology may in, may in, in, and in itself is also a problem. There is a subtle disbelief in the truth of the philosophical and theological sciences, despite the fact that the very definition of science, as I mentioned last night, comes from philosophy. And the entire empirical scientific endeavor is based on philosophical presumptions. This is why they tend to follow evolution, because it comes from a science that has been taught as more certain than philosophy and theology. It's a credibility issue. You're not credible unless you sign off on these guys' theory they're going to think you're ridiculous. One time when I actually had just published my book on psychology, I made the observation that some of the acts that human beings perform are not material. They're not subject to being tested in a lab. As a result of that, if a, if a psychology intentionally neglects and denies that there are activities of human beings that, such as free will, certain acts of the intellect, like judgment and things of this sort, that they deny those things exist and proceed, it's not a valid science. One of the guys came up to me and he said, don't, don't, you know, you should take that out of there. You don't want to say that. I'm like, why? And he says, well, people aren't going to believe you. I'm like, well, that's not the issue. The issue is, is did I write what is true or not? And this is the same problem that we're actually seeing in relationship to evolution and all of this. They want that credibility in the eyes of the world. 
As I mentioned, there are certain facts of philosophy that are more certain than even the empirical sciences. There is also an implicit adoption of Descartes' idea that man, because of reason and that exaggerated uh, thinking that reason can grace, gain certitude if it just follows the right method, will discover all truths about nature. Now, there's a rather lengthy quote I want to give you from St. Thomas, and I know that this has been a bit of a burden. You're getting a lot of This has been information download, I agree. But there are a few things that I think are important for us to see the context of why nobody's defending this. So here's the quote from St. Thomas. That the world was not always was is held only by faith and is not able to be demonstrated as also above it was said of the mystery of the Trinity. Then the reason is that the newness of the world is not able to be demonstrated on the part of the world itself. So what he just got done saying is, the world itself does not contain sufficient evidence for us to know its origins perfectly. For the principle of demonstration is that which is, in other words, it's reality. However, each thing according to the notion of its species is abstracted from the here and now because of what it is said that the universals are everywhere and always. So this goes back to the idea that the natures of things are eternal, they never change. Hence, it is not able to be demonstrated that man or the heavens or a stone not always was. So you can't prove by the natural light of reason certain things in relationship to the created order. Similarly, also, neither on the part of the agent, which acts through the will. For the will of God is not able to be investigated by reason except about that which is absolutely necessary for God to will. However, this does not apply to creatures. The divine will is able to be manifested to man, however, by revelation, on which faith depends. Hence, it is credible that the world began to be. However, it is not demonstrable or knowable. What has he just got done saying? He just got done saying that the only way that we can know the true origins of the world with clarity and certainty is by divine revelation because the actual things themselves in the created order do not contain sufficient information about their origins. And this is useful to be considered, at least perhaps someone presumed to be demonstrated it is of the faith does not induce necessary reasons, which offer material to the laughter of infidels judging us because of their reasons to believe that they are of the faith. So what St. Thomas is saying is that the world began to be and was created new is not something that we can presume to be demonstrated by the natural light of reason. Let's translate that. The empirical sciences are not going to be able to give us a, law, a clear understanding of the precise origins and in how it all went down purely by the evidence that's there because the universe doesn't contain enough information. So if we start to argue that it does, that you can prove that the world began at a certain time, he says you're going to end up being that you can prove it by the natural light of reason. What's going to happen is that it started at a specific point because he's actually addressing um, uh, Anselm here, I think. I think it was Anselm. Maybe it was Ambrose. No, it was Bonaventure, sorry. He was addressing Bonaventure. Because Bonaventure said you can actually prove by the natural light of reason that it had a beginning and the point of time. And he's like, well, look, it, you can't necessarily prove that because it doesn't contain enough information. When considering the discussion at hand, this essentially means that we can only have certitude regarding many matters pertaining to creation by the light of faith in which the church has defined, such as God creating things out of nothing. This does not mean that we do not hold that the world depends on God as a cause for its existence, because you can prove that God exists based upon the world, right? It does not mean that you cannot use arguments and demonstrations to show that the evolutionary hypothesis is untenable, because as Hugh just got done showing, even though we can't prove special creation through the natural light of reason and must hold it by faith. Nevertheless, once we hold it by faith, it becomes clear that the created order lines out with that, even though it doesn't contain all the information to 
to give us certitude about it, then that's why it has to come from faith. We can also know, however, that if you look at the actual evidence, that it's not only against revelation, but it's actually against what we see in the created order itself, because the created order itself does not contain the evidence that supports evolution. What is important to note here is that how things began that is, how things were created can only be known through revelation because the creation itself, the natural world, as I mentioned, doesn't continue, contain sufficient information to deduce how it came to be. St. Thomas says in his Summa, he says, the inception of the world cannot be demonstrated from the standpoint of the world itself. This is the folly of all these guys in the empirical sciences trying to give an explanation of it based purely on what's contained in the natural order. This is one of the reasons why, I must admit, I want to get popcorn and just sit back and click the, the internet and watch all these videos about everybody panicking about all the discoveries of the James uh, World, tel or the James Space Telescope, right? James Webb Space Telescope. Because every time you turn around, they're like, oh no, now we got this. The data is contradicting what they're saying, right? And it's bound to, because it, it, whereas if you held to a special creation, whatever you discover through the natural light of reason is going to nine out with that special creation. Whereas if you hold that there's this evolution, you're going to end up coming with all sorts of data that is going to be contrary to it. So what does this mean in relationship to those who don't want to defend it? Well, many priests have adopted Descartes' ideas, and they also are creatures that very often are subject to human respect. They don't want to look like an idiot. I mean, <laughs> in the very beginning when I was just going after evolution and showing how it was uh, just ridiculous and it just didn't, and it, you know, and it, this brings us back to my original observation. How is it, how is it that I actually saw that evolution was just silly, was the fact that in addition to the right formation, I had the right catechetical upbringing. We have to teach our children clearly in the very beginning, the initial steps are this is how God created the heavens and the earth. And we take them through scripture and we show that this is exactly how these things handled sequentially. Once they start getting older, you have to introduce them to the ideas of evolution to rebut them, so, but they have to have that habit of thinking in their minds of judging things a proper way so that when they get to looking at evolution, they can see the truth of the criticism of it that it doesn't hold water. If you just introduce them to both, then you've got a problem. Like all theological truths, we cannot prove through the natural light of reason the Genesis account. Again, we can only know it by, by faith. But you have to realize that most priests have adopted this attitude of Descartes. And it, I think what it really boils down to is it's a lack of moderation. It's a sign of a moral problem. One of the things that we have to do is we have to curtail or rein in our intellect's desire to know. The vice of curiosity is the desire to know those things that are not proper to our state in life. I don't need to know who Angela Jolene is dating. I don't need to know, you know, whether Alex Baldwin is going to be prosecuted or not. I don't need to know any of that. It's a waste of my time. What I need to know is what, is, what does the Catholic Church teach about X, Y, and Z? Right? That's what I need to know. But what happens is, is that there is in the human intellect not just a desire to know a thing, but to know it with certitude. And there are certain things that I complained last night about the lack of precision. Evolutionary hypothesis and theory is precisely gained ground because of a lack of intellectual precision. If you follow the first principles, and if you follow the principle of evidence very closely, it does not bring you to evolution. And so this is one of the reasons, and it's precisely, and why? Because people want to have certitude from something tangible. They want to be able to look at the evidence. And when you give evidence 
more certitude than it actually admits. This is why we have people telling us it's only going to take two weeks to flatten the curve. This is why they're going to tell us that it's going to ameliorate the, the symptoms of COVID. This is why we have them telling us that a man can be a woman, right? It's it, it, because they're looking for certitude in an excessive manner. And then and that's because they're not reigning in, in their appetites. But then that also means that their appetites are going to be pursue a certain thing. So the principle of imminence, which basically de degenerates into emotion, emotionally we want that certitude, and so we're going to be giving things more certitude than they actually have. And I think that's a large part of why people subscribe to evolution. They want it to have more certitude because then they can be intellectually satisfied. When in point in fact, if you actually look at special creation, it indicates a more, it gives you a greater intellectual satisfaction. The failing on the side of some traditions is because they believe that to hold to the Genesis account despite what the Pontifical Bible Commission judged is basically fundamentalism. Even in some of the current magisterium, even the best of them fear of saying anything that seems to be fundamentalist, especially in regard to the first three chapters of Genesis. Don't want to do that. We don't want to look ridiculous. Well, how about just looking like you're telling the truth, right? The problem lies in acquiescing to holding that Genesis account is somehow fundamentalism. Fundamentalism is defined as a movement of the 20th century Protestantism emphasizing the literal interpretation of the Bible as fundamental to Christian life and belief. Fundamentalism tends to take scriptures literally when they're not supposed to be. For example, upon this rock I will build my church. Now, Peter ain't a rock. Sometimes he seemed to be a blockhead, but he wasn't a rock. But then there's also a time in which the magisterium has to tell us, based upon the tradition of the church, when it is to be taken literally. My body, this is my body. John 6 is literally true from the entire tradition, and therefore it's not fundamentalism to take that as literally true. And this is one of the reasons why the church had to step in and say, no, what happened in Genesis is actually historically true. They had to step in and say, this is the progression. But when it comes to the Genesis account, we are bound to hold to its literal sense according to the Pontifical Bible Commission, which at the time of its ruling was part of the magisterium. But they're simply reflecting, and this is the thing we have to remember, they're simply reflecting the entire tradition of the church. But herein lies another attitude problem. If things are progressing and if the Hegelian dialectic is true and we're all evolving towards this omega point, according to Teilhard, but we're all advancing to a better state, then that means that modern man is better than his superiors. I call it the modern man superiority complex. We think today that somehow or another we're superior to those who went before us. Well, one of the things that genetic entropy shows us is, is that we're getting dumber, as I mentioned last night. There are certain things that we don't know. Even the, I mean, it's astounding. I mean, just my, I'm actually in the process of compiling a book. It's just called Shop Talk. It's the one-liners from my father. He was a master at these things. You know, he would just like throw out like, he would just, he just, uh, 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 hold off so that you have to buy the book, right? <laughs> but you just realize that their form, not just their formation, but even you can see that intellectually we're degrading. But the problem is, is that modern man, some traditionists, not all, of course, but most members of the current magisterium think that the people in the past were stupid, unintelligent, uneducated. They just didn't know any better. We know better. I'll give you a perfect example. The modern scripture scholarship says, well, you know, the, uh, the reason why we actually think that the scriptures were originally written in, in, um, in uh, Greek is because of the lineages of the various scriptures, and they never had an understanding in the past of the lineages of the various scriptural texts, and so that's why they never really realized what we did, because we're so much more intelligent, that they were originally written in Greek and Hebrew. Hello. There was a protracted long, 
drawn out discussion at the Council of Trent and afterwards over that exact issue because the Protestants were changing scriptures and the Catholic Church settled on the Vulgate as the only scriptural line that they had certitude about its lineage. People say, well, in the original Greek, there is no such thing as the original Greek. We have later manuscripts. Well, in the original Hebrew, there is no original Hebrew. What we do know is that Jerome had first generation copies of the original Hebrews of the Gospels which were originally written in Hebrew, if you read tradition and actually study it properly. The reason, the point being is, is that they, so they just act like that somehow or another our ancestors were just stupid and somehow we didn't understand these things. Do you honestly believe that St. Augustine, who wrote an entire tract on scripture, didn't understand that there were difficulties in interpretations of certain passages and the fact that sometimes they were recounted slightly differently in the gospels? You know, they just act like everybody in this past was stupid. Meanwhile, our intelligence keeps degrading. Furthermore, so they, that sometimes even the traditions kind of think, well, you know, that was then. They kind of succumb to that. They don't necessarily think that, but that's in their thinking. Part of the reason of the magisterium not defending the traditional creation account is because of the rejection and not adherence to the principle of the integral good of the greatest generation. If you pay very close attention to the moral manuals and to things that were written after 1960, if you pay very close attention to their discussion of evolution, and if you pay very close attention to their discussion of ecclesiology, the greatest generation did not believe in the principle of the integral good. They didn't believe in it. In the end, we can ultimately boil down to fear. They did not want to be seen as stupid, backward, not up to date, anachronistic, unscientific. They didn't want to be seen as unintelligent and just not with it. Rather than the real issue, which is at the very root of it is a real moral problem. It's an unwillingness to follow the truth regardless of the personal cost. To adhere to special creation requires suffering. Just like it is in a time when there's a lot of heresy, those who subscribe to the heresy ridicule and downplay and persecute those who adhere to what the church has always held. It's the same thing. But there has to be a willingness to follow the truth regardless of the personal cost. And so in the end, it's just a lack of fortitude and a lack of truthfulness and bad intellectual formation. They don't want to stand out. We must have the fortitude, but also the willingness to adhere to reality. I'm willing to follow the truth regardless of the personal cost, because in the end, that's what perfects my intellect. St. Thomas says that the truth is the good of the intellect. Not what I want, not what seems nice, but what is the actual truth? And that means my mind, I, my mind becomes perfected when it adheres to reality, not to my emotions. And this is one of the things that we have to do. Now, what does this mean? Because if we're going to say that this, this in unwillingness to actually follow this is one of the reasons why evolution is, is, has, has basically taken over. It's in virtually every facet of the church's teachings these days. Not the churches, but people that are part of the church. <coughs> it boils down to one fundamental thing. Even though we must mount a tremendous defense of special creation and at least show that evolution is not a viable hypothesis. We have to do that, even in relationship to the secular world. We have to defend the truth and we have to show that they're on the wrong track, if for no other reason than pure charity for them. But it also means something very fundamental, which I've talked about in another conference, and that is, so goes the church, goes the world. The fact that this stuff collapsed in the church means that the graces to adhere to special creation is not going to be flooded into the world until the church gets its act together. To see, and this I think goes back ultimately, the clarity when I first time I heard evolution, the clarity that I had that that was fundamentally false and that, uh, that special creation is so clearly true and so much better was, I think, grace. It's not me. It's nothing special about me. 
I'll be the first to admit, as my conference on singularity is, I'm not special. It's not me, it's grace. To see these things requires a grace, and God gives that grace, but you have to be two things. Grace comes through hearing. This is one of the reasons why conferences like this are so important. But the other side of it is, is there, there has to be a response to that grace, and we have to merit that grace. We have to start praying for our clergy to be faithful to the church's tradition in this regard, to the magisterium's faithfulness to the tradition in this regard. And once we do that, once the church becomes faithful to what it has been given by God, then we can see the grace will be merited for the rest of the world because all grace comes into the world by means of the Catholic Church. It does not mean that only Catholics get grace. It means, though, that the Catholic Church, which is the mystical body of Christ, is in fact the, the grace that through which all grace comes. And so we have to merit the grace for the secular world to abandon this, this error, this fundamental error. And they're not going to abandon it until we do our part. But we have to start with our own clergy. We have to be praying, doing prayers, sufferings, and good works for their conversion in this regard, if nothing else. Or at least to get the grace to be willing to adhere to it and to defend it. Okay, we'll stop there. Okay, um, the last part of our conference today, I'd just like to remind everyone of the um, important last steps that we have here, the Q&A cards, so we've got time left for the question and answer. Um, the ushers will be coming around to collect them. Okay, so hopefully you have them ready. Please only one question per speaker um, per person. So each person gets two questions. And then um, another thing that's important is your survey. We'd really like to hear what you think about this conference today and our speakers and how um, we can support endeavors like this in the future. So there may be people in the audience who would like to have a conference like this or to invite these speakers. We've already had a couple of requests about how to get these speakers. So um, please do let us know on the survey. There's a part two to this conference. So if you're interested in that, let us know because there may be people in the audience or in the church who would want to put on a part two. So let us know about that in the surveys and then put the surveys in the boxes at the back or give them to the ushers and they'll find their way. The survey boxes are going around, okay? Um, let's see if I missed anything. Don't forget about the forms for the brain death that affects us all. And as I was thinking here, I know we called this the Restore Truth Conference. I would just like to leave you with two last thoughts. Number one, We've got a information overload because these gentlemen today had so much information to give in so little time. And they did their best. And my personal opinion, they knocked it out of the park. But number one... <laughs> here's my challenge to you. Number one, follow the truth no matter where it takes you. No matter what personal cost it gives you because there will be a personal cost. All right, all of, us, all of us in here know that. Number two, how does this information affect my life, meaning all of your lives, and the life of those you love? And that's the reason why you have to continue spreading this information because it affects you now. Everything that they talked about is not just an academic, um, it's not just an academic discussion, it affects your everyday lives. Okay, so with that, thank you for your donations and your generosity. Um, again, just in case anyone doesn't know, the checks, if you give cash, we greatly appreciate it. Um, checks can be made out to the Colbe Center, St. John the Evangelist Church, and Father Ripperger's um, society is SMD. S is in Sam, M is in Mary, D is in Delta. Okay, um, so with that, hopefully we've got some questions ready for Q&A. We'll give them just a couple of seconds to go through.
going to excite me and pray for them. Okay, so there were a few questions from last night that I wanted to address that uh, kind of came in, which I think are actually uh, worth taking a look at. The first one is, um, yes, speech has gotten very sloppy. Uh, people's thinking and speech has gotten imprecise. Um, but it's not restricted just to that, uh, to free speech. So is not free speech the death of all sciences? Long term it is. In fact, what most people are unaware of is that the church actually condemned um, the uh, uh, free freedom of speech. And the reason it condemned it, that they said, is because in the end you can't protect the common good. Where the freedom lies is in the freedom to always tell the truth, not to say whatever you want, but to tell the truth is where the freedom truly lies. Okay. Uh, I heard today that the papers are being prepared to allow divorce and remarriage to receive the Holy Eucharist without change of circumstances or repentance. How do I explain this to my children as I have newer remarried and taught them the father is living in adultery? Well, it basically boils down to one fundamental thing is, is that the church's teaching regarding these matters does not change. And so even if they were to put something like that out, the entire tradition of the church has always taught that. Um, you cannot be validly married and your other spouse still al and your spouse be alive and you remarry someone else. That's adultery. So, and, whereas an annulment basically states that from the very beginning there was no marriage, and so you, the church once it declares that, then you can remarry, and that's technically speaking not remarried because technically speaking you weren't married in the beginning. Okay. So the point being is, is that I realize they're trying to come out with this, to uh, b being in the state of adultery, of course. The real fundamental problem isn't even the question about the divorce and remarriage. The real question is, can you receive communion in the state of mortal sin? Well, St. Paul ended that discussion, right? That he who receives communion, in the, that he receives communion unworthily is guilty of the same, and he's referring to having crucified Christ. So it's, the church has always said it's morally sinful, it's one of the worst sins you can commit because it's sacrilege. And so the church has said, no, you can't, you're not to do that. You have to go to confession first. Okay. How do you explain adaptations that can be visibly seen within a species? So we actually see this. So there are times in which, uh, um, in fact, this is something that maybe you or someone else can talk to a little bit more uh, directly. We obviously see, for example, among the deer population, there's all sorts of number of deer. Now, it's not like there were, you know, let's just say for the sake of argument, there's 40 different species of deer. It's not like they took all those deer onto the ark, right? So what would happen is, is that, they got, that God would actually take on this, the specific species onto the ark, and then after that, there's adaptations that occur. What does that mean? So the, I keep saying that the essence of a thing doesn't change. What a thing is doesn't change. So if they say, well, human beings will evolve out of their bodies, well, that's not a human being, because what a human being is is a body-soul composite, right? And so what constitutes a deer, the essence of the thing never changes. And so every single deer, regardless of size, hair color, all that, has the same essence or nature, right? Okay. Now, in the interesting thing, St. Thomas says that the only thing that we know the specific difference on ultimately is the human being. Because we know that human beings are different from other animals by virtue of the fact that we have reason. He said, when in relationship to other animals, their accidental qualities are such, and our, the darkness of our intellect is such that we can't perfectly grasp what one species is and another. This is why, even within the scientific community, they can't even agree on what a species is and what species is which, right? But what that tells you is, is that in the same nature or essence, you can have something that has a variety of different, what we call accidental qualities. So the accidents are, is defined as, an accident is defined as that which exists in another as in a subject. What does that mean? The color of your hair doesn't change. If you were to change the color of your hair, you wouldn't say, oh, Bessie Sue had her hair colored. She's no longer human, right? You wouldn't say that. Because the color of our hair, the color of our skin, our race, even our gender, except these are accidents, and they're not the nature of who, uh, or the nature of what we are. Whereas the accidental, and this gives us an indicator that you can have a nature, <clears throat> such as human nature, 
that can have a variety of different kinds of accidental qualities, because some people have long hair, some people, or some people have red hair, some people have brown hair, right? And they're all human, so the nature of humanity is the same. It's the same species. But we, all, we can have different accidental qualities. This is the same size. So, for example, I always tell people the church is against birth control, but it is in favor of girth control. Right? So you can have people who are much larger than other people, right? And does it mean that somehow or another they're less human or more human or what have you? Their essence remains the same, but the accidental qualities change. And that tells you that within a given essence that they can have a variety of different accidents within a certain gamut, but there are certain accidental qualities they cannot have. So, for example, a human being can have a specific color of hair, but we can't have the same accidental qualities as lead, right? So, and this gives us an indicator that different things have different accidental qualities that can exist within them. And so when, you're ta when you see, evol uh, when they talk about uh, uh, evolution, it's never a case of one species going to another. That's nowhere in any of the fossil records. There's no proof of that. In fact, it's, a, it's actually an impossibility based on a variety of different levels. But it is possible that within the confines of accidents for the animals to change over the course of time accidentally so that you can have those different accidents passed on in different locations. And this is why, say, a horse in one place is different from another or larger than another. This is why we have so many different kinds of different kinds of dogs is because these are accidentally different, but they're all part of the nature of a dog, right? And so it's, what, what that basically means is that you can have change, what they call sometimes ma uh, microevolution. You can have changes within the accidental qualities of things as long as it remains within that gamut but not within the species, which they call macroevolution. So we don't see one species becoming another. We just see that there's accidental qualities, changes within different species. So I just wanted people to get a sense of that. So when people point out, well, you know, the fruit fly is this and that, well, yeah, okay, that just means it's still all fruit flies. It's just that the accidental qualities will slightly change. And Hugh gave a great example of that last night regarding the lizard, okay. So I'm, I'm going to try to go through a number of these. Uh, a number of people asked if the earth is flat. <laughs> no. No, God revealed that the earth is a sphere. And we have a book on our website. It's uh, only available as a PDF. It's called Flat Earth, Flat Wrong. And if you know somebody that has been deceived in this respect and they can't afford the $5 or whatever it is, we'll give it to them. Because Robertson Janus was not disrespectful to the flat earth thinkers. He took a tremendous amount of time to study their arguments, and he, rec he recognized that there are some very highly intelligent people who have come to believe in this, and he takes their arguments seriously, but he shows that they're wrong. And it is a pure myth that the church ever believed or taught a flat earth. There's practically unanimity among the fathers of the church that the earth is a globe. And the tradition of the church in her sacred art and iconography shows that the earth is a globe. So God would be deceiving us if he allowed this sacred art and iconography to teach us something that is not true. So. I hope that answers that question. A number of people asked about um, how to restore this traditional teaching on creation. 
And Father told us the most important part, which is to uh, live our faith. And we chose the Immaculate Conception as our principal patroness, even though we named the Kobe Center after St. Maximilian Kobe. And we believe that we must consecrate ourselves to our Lord Jesus Christ through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And then we must live that consecration in every moment. And we believe that when enough Catholics live our consecration to Jesus through Mary in every thought, in every word, and in every action, then that will constitute the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. Because the triumph of the Immaculate Heart is not something outside, it's something inside. And so when enough of us do this, then that will obtain the grace for everything else that she promised, including the ear of peace and the greatest evangelization the world has ever seen, the social reign of Christ our King. But we have materials that we can also use to help spread this truth. Um, the uh, DVD series, Foundations Restored, is being used by many, many families all over the world. There are priests all over the world who are showing it to their parishes, their homeschool co-ops that are using it. A bishop in Uganda has approved it as an official course, and our webmaster is creating a website for the Soroti Diocese in Uganda. And if you get our email newsletter, which is free, we have the sign up downstairs, we'll let you know when that website is done. And then any Catholic in the world can go to their superiors and ask to take this course as a continuing education course because it's a diocesan approved course with the whole thing on the website. And there are um, tests that you take after each episode to demonstrate that you understand the content. And everything we have is on a suggested donation basis. So if you can't afford the suggested donation, which is $99 for the teacher's guide and 18 and a half hours worth of video, we'll give it to you for whatever you can afford. And I don't know anybody that's watched the whole thing who hasn't been convinced. There was a very <laughs> intelligent young man who was extremely knowledgeable in the natural sciences whose mother asked him to watch it. And he told us later the only reason he agreed was so that he could tear it to pieces. But after he watched it with his mom, he became totally convinced. And now he goes to a traditional Catholic college, which is very good, except that <laughs> they teach theistic evolution. And he's been trying now to at least open up the discussion on campus. So we recommend that. And um, some people asked about science textbooks. Pamela Acker, our main biologist, was the primary author of a new biology textbook called Biology, a Catholic Perspective. And I believe it's the, the greatest science textbook ever written at least in modern times, and I highly recommend it. It comes with the uh, laboratory manual and uh, exercises and the answer key. Unfortunately, I don't have any more copies with me, but you can find it on the website. That is really a tremendous asset. And hopefully in the future, if you get our newsletter, we're trying to publish more materials for young people. Hopefully, we could publish textbooks in other areas of natural science. If you email me, I have a whole document with recommendations that I'm happy to send you, but it's too much for me to try to remember them all. 
and give them to you now. Um, and then also, on our website, we have some short videos, and for people that do not want to take the time to watch, say, even the first two episodes of Foundations Restored, which you can watch for free on the website foundationsrestored.com. You can see the first two episodes for nothing. Um, we have these shorter videos, and if you watch them with in, a, in the order that we recommend, in about one hour, you could really make an impact on a person, even like a 12-year-old child, who is willing to, to, to watch them because they really make the most important points in a, in a very short form. And we also have on the website some uh, what are called Darwin's documentaries, which are satires made by homeschooling Catholics, <laughs> which are hilarious, but they really do bring out <laughs> the fatal flaws in uh, evolution. So you can look for those, Darwin's documentaries. Um, okay, I, I, my time's probably up, right, for my round, or what would you say? Okay, but I just want to let Father Ripperger come back and I'm losing track of the time. I'll just answer one other question, then when my turn comes again, I can go down the rest of my list. So. A number of people asked about extreme weather, whether it's a consequence of sin or just climate change. And we've tried to make the point that the climate alarmists are basing their alarmism on a misinterpretation of scientific evidence about past conditions. So if we could get back to accepting God's revelation about the past, then we'd be able to interpret the evidence correctly about the future. But I do want to say that one of the many negative consequences of theistic evolution is that it makes God seem very remote and uninvolved in the creation Whereas when we accept God at his word in Genesis as, our, as the fathers and doctors did, we know that we are the apple of his eye. He created everything for us and that he's always intimately involved and that because he put man at the height of the hierarchy on earth, all the other creatures are subordinated we're supposed to have dominion over them. We're supposed to care for them. But we are the ones who have been placed as masters over the creation. And so when we do not act according to God's will, then that creates a disorder. And it does lead to natural disasters. So that when you read the lives of the saints, you see so many examples where they prophetically warned of natural disasters as a consequence of sin, like Saint Antonio Maria Claret, who was sent uh, to Cuba and found terrible disorders in the, in the church there um, and did an amazing job of restoring the faith, restoring the church. Um, there are examples where he warned people of earthquake as a chastisement for their sins. And then he, 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 he saw that when the people didn't repent from the earthquake, that there would be cholera. And this would then finally bring the people to repent. And he, he says that these things were the most effective preachers. <laughs> but the problem is the acceptance of evolution among Catholics has reached such a point that a terrible thing has happened. There are natural disasters and people don't see it as coming from God and so they don't repent. And that is terrifying. 
And so that emphasizes the fact that we really have to intensify our prayers and the living of our consecration so that we can obtain the grace so that when terrible things happen as a consequence of sin, we are able to understand and see it as a call to repentance. I think I should stop there. Uh, this was actually wrote, written to Hugh, and you may want to speak to it afterwards. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm going to take a shot at it. So, how can Adam live 900 years and know? Uh, and now lifespan is 85. So, what happened was, if you look at the actual account, so you know, uh, Methuselah I think lived to be 800 and 986 years or something like that. But they lived to be extremely old. And a lot of times, the modern scripture scholars come out and say, oh, well, they just calculated time differently. And I'm like, no, they didn't. Because actually, there's a specific point after the flood. God says man just sins too much, and he, in he intentionally shortens man's life to a maximum of 120 years. And so, and then most people, 70, 80 years, and it's over, right? Several years ago, I was actually reading an article about the fact that they, you know, in the discuss, in the, in the, they discovered that the aging process, um, part of the aging process, not the totality, but part of the aging process is at the end of your DNA are these things called tolomers. And as you age, they begin to split. Now, when you're younger, if they split, the body has a mechanism, chemical mechanism, to reconnect those tolomers. And that's what, so it's when your DNA remains intact that you actually are young. It's as they begin to split that, it, that you begin to age and your things just don't seem to work quite right, right? Okay. So uh, when I was, I was reading this in, in the discovery, a few years before that they said if man didn't age, they did a study, they said if man didn't age, he would, his body would basically wear out somewhere between eight and 900 years if he didn't age. So what this probably is an indicator is, is that God actually changed our aging process at a certain point. They also, um, a, G, a team of geneticists uh, at the University of Southern California has discovered a way to extend human life to 800 years, possibly. There is a study that's being done right now. It's been, they've been very quiet about it. NASA realized if we're going to send people to Mars, there's going to be a lot of genetic damage that these people are going to suffer from all the radiation. So they, be, they basically did an extensive study to figure out exactly what it is in young people's body that causes their DNA to regenerate, and they figured it out. So they actually have, the initial study was actually done with um, mice. They would take old, very old mice who could hardly even walk, couldn't hardly get up, and they would take young mice, and then, but they would feed them this thing that they had figured out this is what it is caused. They give it to these mice. Within a week, they were keeping up with the young mice. They're now in the human clinical trials. People will pay big money for that. <laughs> okay. So anyway, the point is, is that it's actually literally true that they did live that long. And that at a certain point, God basically changed our aging process and cut our lifespan actually down. Now, I personally believe that part of being human is that you have to accept the punishment that's due to your sins. And I think trying to extend our life beyond these things, I mean, it's true and with illnesses, we always, God provided remedies in nature for, this is the whole point of St. Hildegard, he provided nature, uh, remedies in nature for our illnesses, so even though we get ill... You know, we're never going to cut that out, but we still have things that can help ameliorate that. Whereas aging, I think, is a different kind of an animal. I think to basically get to the point where we're not willing to accept the punishment of the aging as a result of our sins, I think that's problematic. I think it's unjust, frankly. The best way to help convert your husband. And <laughs> I'm going to lump that in with two more. When our priests are in error about, uh, about all of this, what are we supposed to do about it? And another one was, when are we going to get the Pope to tell the truth about this? Okay. <laughs> There's a positive and a negative to any form of conversion. 
The positive is, people, that to convert to see the truth of these matters, because they're supernatural in nature, you actually need grace to see the truth about them. So you have to do offer up your prayer, suffering, and good works for that grace so that they will see this. This is true even in relationship with the priests in this. You're going to have to do prayer, suffering, and good works so they see the grace of the truth of special creation. You're also going to have to do this even in relationship to the Pope. I tell people, you know, in the, uh, the before, they even inscripted by 1962, but in the 1944 version of the Missal, during Lent, there was a collect that was done every single day for the Pope. So literally the hundreds of thousands of masses offered around the world, there were hundreds of thousands of prayers said at mass for the Holy Father. We stopped praying for the guy and then we un- wonder why he's acting weird. You know, well, he's under attack, and this is the, you have to be able to provide the grace for him to do the, those things that are right. And I, I say to myself, you know, if we get the leaders we deserve, what does that mean about us as a people that God would give us Joe Biden and Pope Francis? God love him. I mean, I, I do have a love for the Pope, but what does that mean? Right? Okay. So that's the positive side, you have to get the grace. The, the negative side is you gotta keep demons out of people's hair because demons can influence people's thoughts and actually their um, emotions. And as a result, God can give people a subtle grace to, hey, maybe you should convert. And then the demons step in and then incite fear. Well, if you change, then this means this is gonna happen. This is gonna... So you have to say binding prayers. And uh, one of the most effective things is consecrating the person every single day to Our Lady a lot of times will keep the demons at bay so that they'll respond to grace and you'll see them slowly change. Um, And I think that's even true in relationship to getting the priest to teach about this. It is diabolic in the sense that what God, the demons have a particular hatred about how God created us and they don't want us to know it because in that creation is a manifestation of how much he loves us. And that's one of the reasons why I think that evolution is so diabolic is because of the fact that it, it's like uh, Hugh just said, it, it distances God from us. Um, I would like the tra- Catholic Church to come out strongly against transgenderism as it is in denouncing evolution. Will that occur? It's going to be a while. Before we get to transgenderism, in fact, one of the questions people actually had was, what's the end game in all of that? What's the end game in the destruction of the sciences? Well, as far as the transgenderism goes, I think ultimately, um, first of all, it's, it's irrational, obviously. It's contrary to the evidence. Um, but it's also contrary to just how we understand it in, in human beings. And the people in charge that are pushing this know that. They know it's not rational. That's exactly why they're pushing it because their goal is to weaken us. Part of communism is to, you have to tear people down psychologically in their identity, both in their, um, their national identity, their regional identity. You have to tear them down in their own psychological identity because once you get them that weak, then you can control them. This is also the end game as to why all the sciences are collapsing and in the sense that, and why the sciences are at, real scientists are under attack, because real science leads you to the truth. And that's the last thing they want. If you know the truth, then you're gonna stand in opposition to what they're trying to propose. So I think that that's, will the church ever denounce it? Eventually. But I think there's gonna have to be a series of things the church is gonna have to address. Someone asked, you know, is evolution the only error of Russia? No, there's a whole series of errors of Russia, but one of them is feminism itself. If you read, some of you might have heard this, let me say this, if you read the interview of Clara Zenkin of Vladimir Lenin, it's right online. You could lift out the names and it would sound like they were, inter- that they were basically interviewing Nancy Pelosi. There is no difference. It is the full, he lays out the whole structure of modern feminism, which you might have heard me say is basically just the curse of Eve on steroids, right? And so they're the ones that are pushing this. They're going to have to condemn the the feminism because it's contrary to the nature of, of true femininity and to the nobility of motherhood. They're going to have to, con- and I think that's part of the reason against the transgenderism because in transgenderism, when people go through transgender surgery, they end up sterile. So it's anti-life. 
It also, the transgender stuff is also to tear down our understanding of clear distinctions. This is one of the reasons why in the past, you could always see the degradation in a culture when the, because um, transgenderism is not anything new. Now the surgeries are, but the transgender and stuff is not new. You even see there's, there's talks in the Roman period about guys dressing up as women, etc. So this has been around for a while. It's just that now it's gotten off the ground. And so I think that it's the, the ultimate goal is the destruction of true femininity and motherhood specifically, the nobility and magnificence of the office of motherhood. And it's also the destruction of masculinity and true patriarchy and its benefits. I think that's its ultimate destructive goal. Because you tear down any semblance of what it means to be a man or to be a woman. I, I get such a gas, I'll try and shut up here so Hugh can get up. But I, I uh, get such a gas out of these guys, you know, that are transgenders who are going and playing in women's sports. And then, to prove the point, you get this guy who's the dead weight lifter champion and then he, full beard, says, I'm a woman today, crushes all the women's things, and then the next day says, no, I'm a guy again, yeah. you know. And then they're like, you have to call me by my pronouns. Well, what's going to happen if you get a guy who claims to be a woman but still wants to use male pronouns? I mean, that's what's coming next. I mean, it's just all silly. Okay. Uh, and I'll let you up here. Someone asked how we can know that the days of Genesis 1 were 24-hour days since God is outside of time. So uh, I tried to explain yesterday that God, of course, is outside of time and he could have created the world in any period of time that he chose. But time is the measure of change and all the fathers and doctors teach that once God created creatures, time came into existence. St. Thomas says, even if there were only angels, there would be time because of a succession of their acts. So why did he create everything in six 24-hour days and consecrate the seventh day? Because he loves us, and from the very beginning, by the very way that he created the world, he gave us the rhythm by which we must live if we want to live a happy, healthy, holy life. And a lot of the illness, both spiritual and physical, of the modern world flows directly from not obeying this rhythm. And think about it. Do you think that people would show more respect for the Lord's day? if they believed that God created everything in six days and consecrated the seventh day and that the church transferred the Lord's day to Sunday, not only because it is the day of the resurrection, but for all Christians, it was also the first day of creation when God created the heavens and the earth and created the light and the angels and separated the light from the darkness, of course. And when Our Lady came to La Salette, she was weeping mainly because of two sins, blasphemy against the name of God and a violation of the Lord's day. Do you think it's a coincidence that Charles Lyell published his book at almost the exact time that Our Lady of Salat appeared? It's not a coincidence. Because once people began to think that geology proved that the earth was thousands and then hundreds of thousands and then millions of years old, that's when they denied, they began to deny that God created everything in six days. But we must realize that in Hebrew, the word yom, which is the Hebrew word for day, when it's used with the phrase evening and morning, it always means a 24-hour day. There are no exceptions. And Maimonides was like the 
Thomas Aquinas of the Jewish tradition in the Middle Ages. He summed up the tradition of biblical interpretation within the Jewish people from the beginning. And he's categorical. Yom means a 24-hour day. And he's also categorical that the, while the days of creation week were 24-hour days, yet it was a totally supernatural creation. So that's not only our tradition from the apostles, it's our tradition going back to the very beginning of salvation history. Um, let me just ask, uh, ask, let me just answer one last question, and please feel free to email me. We, we won't refuse to answer any question, and I'm happy to refer you to one of our scientists if uh, I can't answer it. But a number of people asked about Galileo, and uh, a priest friend of mine who uh, was in graduate school in biochemistry before he entered the priesthood, he told me how he remembered that they had faculty meetings and the professors were very concerned because quite a few of the students seemed to believe in this biblical creation and they were really upset about it. So this one professor said, just mention Gal Galileo, that shuts them up every time. And at the Second Vatican Council, when Cardinal Suenens wanted his brother bishops to open up to contraception, he said, science has given us a new understanding of what is according to natural law. Please, my brothers, we don't want another Galileo affair. So the devil has been using this tactic very effectively for a long time. And yet the reality is, if you study the history, the church handled the Galileo affair perfectly because all educated people like St. Robert Bellarmine and the church knew that the Ptolemaic model of the solar system was inadequate. But what many people don't realize is that the greatest astronomer of that age was not Copernicus, was not Galileo, it was Tycho Brahe. And Tycho Brahe formulated on the basis of more actual observations of the heavens that had ever been made than had ever been made in, at least in recent history, he formulated the model which had the planets going around the sun and the sun going around the earth. And the greatest astronomers in the church were the Jesuit astronomers, and they preferred the system of Tycho Brahe to the system of Galileo because it could accommodate all the astronomical observations, but it, it didn't deny the literal and obvious sense of scripture, which clearly taught that the earth was not moving and was at or close to the center of the universe. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but St. Hildegard of Bingen, who was made a doctor of the church by Pope Benedict, was shown by God the constitution of the universe, and she was shown the same model of the solar system that Tycho Brahe arrived at through his examination of the heavens. Now, what are the odds that St. Hildegard of Bingen would have been shown that model of the solar system and that the greatest astronomer of the age of Galileo and Copernicus would formulate it independently based on astronomical observations. If you look at our materials, especially our new DVD series, How the World Was Made in Six Days, you'll see that the actual observational evidence is more consistent with Tycho's model and St. Hildegard's model 
than with any other model. To this day, and more and more observational data is confirming that that model is the best one, the one that God revealed to us. And this is also related to the question that a number of people asked about the light. How can the universe be only 6,000 years, 7,000 years, if we're seeing light from galaxies that are billions of light years away? Well, you have to understand that the fact that we see light coming redshifted in every direction around the Earth is already an indication that we're in a central position. Edwin Hubble recognized this, and the only reason he rejected that interpretation was because he said, it's unacceptable for us to be in the center. That's just not, we can't have that. And so that led to all the things that people are being taught today. But light can be redshifted for a number of different reasons. And the, if you email me, I can send you the best explanation for the redshift, which is explained within a framework where the Earth is in a central position. And what's happening is the light is being affected by gravity from where it's originating. And it's redshifting, and that's why we're seeing all this light redshifted. But the, the, the speed of light can far exceed the speed of light as we measure it here on Earth, as even Einstein admitted in his general theory of relativity. And when you interpret the evidence within the framework of the Neo-Tychonian model, which has the Earth at the center and the planets going around the sun and the sun going around the Earth, you can explain very well how that light could be transmitted from very distant galaxies almost instantaneously. So it's too much to try to explain it now, <laughs> but if you uh, email me, I can send you to the links. And if you get the first DVD that we have downstairs, which is day one of how the world was made in six days, you'll already begin to get a good understanding of this. So thank you very much. <laughs> yes, so, and, and if it would be possible to organize another one of these conferences in the near future, then we could go into a lot more depth in a number of these areas. Okay, the first question, or the first thing is, uh, give us one of your father's one-liners. So I used to work as a mechanic uh, around my father, and one day, this was just, just as I was, I was actually a subdeacon at the time, and he just said to me, the problem, he, I mean, just out of the blue, he just says, the problem with the modern priesthood is there's no more men left in it. <laughs> he, that, he was brutal, okay. Uh, is receiving organs from an organ harvesting not moral since organs was removed when the donor was still alive when they were removed. There are three kinds of organs. There are organs that are twinable, so like you can take a part of the liver and it will, that part will grow back, and you can take some part of that liver and do that. So they can, you can get, receive those legitimately. Obviously, we're presuming that you're not getting them from China, all right? Okay, the second one is um, those which are twinned, such as kidneys. So you could donate a kidney and actually get that. That would be legitimate. And then there's those that are neither twinnable nor twinned, and those, um, it would be immoral to actually receive them because the person has to be alive in order to take them. Okay. 
Uh, how old does the church believe God's creation uh, was created? The general consensus is somewhere between six and 10,000, 10,000 on the very outside, but the most it's somewhere around 6,000, okay? Um, we are truly living in an age of miracles then, aren't we? We will see God raising up the greatest saints, won't we? Uh, I hope so. After all, as we have devolved, God has further to lift us up, heroic virtue, further to go. Okay, your thoughts. Yes, I do actually see that. I'm seeing there's, um, there's some of the, especially among the young, there are certain graces that we've been starting to see here for about the last 10 or so years. You're seeing graces that are kind of extraordinary. I mean, there's, um, and so God is giving the people the grace to kind of get things straightened out. However, I do also think that it's going to, um, the saints, I mean, we're going to go through a time of persecution, so we're going to be seeing a lot of that, and we still, we'll see some of the greatest saints. I think we're already seeing some of them. But we're going to, uh, it's going to be very brutal. And then um, the era of peace, which is supposed to be, I mean, there's all sorts of theories about all this stuff, but um, Our Lady said that there would be 25 years of good harvest after the chastisement when she appeared in La Salette. So once we get spanked, um, I think you'll see a lot of things change for the better. Um, but in the meantime, I think you're going to see God use this uh, situation. The situation is bad. It's very grave, but it can also be used for your sanctification if you're willing to suffer. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is a call to penance. You know, one of the things is Christ said that in relationship, he says, because the apostle says, why couldn't we get these demons out? And he said, well, there are certain demons that can only be cast out by prayer and uh, um, fasting. And so one of the things we're going to have to, what we really need to do is we need to do uh, penance on a variety of different levels. But I think in relationship to this specific topic, we do need to do penance for the sake of the priests and the clergy and the church to be able to um, readopt that and see the truth of special creation. The second thing is that we also need to do it, obviously, for the, for the pro-life situation and all of that. Um, and then we also, I think, just need to do it in general. So penance really should be the call today. So I would really encourage you to do penance so that the people who hear this message will actually accept it and be open to it. Because, A, we gotta, it's like anything else. We've got to keep the demons out. But then also, we need, they need to receive the grace so that when they hear this truth, they'll be willing to accept it. Okay. And so uh, what I'm going to do is give you a final blessing. Benedicto de Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, descendit super vos et semper. Amen. <laughs>